five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon and welcome to the Council Committee of the Whole meeting of November 4th. I apologize to those who were ready to go earlier. We uh, had some great news to announce and did an opening of the bridge that is adjacent to the new regional hospital. So we are slightly delayed. So thank you for your patience. I'm going to call this meeting to order. And first on the agenda is delegations. We are aware of um, five delegations for sure. Um, but uh, first on the list is uh, Regan Dirksen. If you would like to turn your camera on, uh, just introduce yourself for those who are watching and then we can uh, get started. Thanks. I'm not really sure why my camera isn't working. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can, we can hear you. Um, maybe just click it on and off once. Let's see. Oh, again. here we go. There we, okay, go. there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, about five to seven minutes, uh, and then council will have a time for questions following your presentation. All right. Thank you. Um, so my name is Reagan Dirksen, and I am speaking today on behalf of myself and dozens of other uh, City of Grand Prairie employees. Um, so this is my first time speaking at a council meeting, so I just want to apologize in advance if I make any etiquette mistakes. I did send an email out to council this morning that included the documents that I'll be sharing today. My apologies for the short notice, but I didn't have much time to prepare this. So some of the things that we like to bring up today is how it seems that this policy, um, the assumption is being made that due to the high vaccination rates at the city of Grand Prairie, that it's assumed that most employees agree with, these, with a vaccination mandate, which couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I have personally had the opportunity to speak with dozens of employees, and I've been told by the vast majority of them that regardless of <clears throat> their vaccination status, most people do not agree with medical procedures being the choice of someone else, and they should always be the choice of the individual. Unfortunately, no employees were consulted during the drafting of this policy, and if it is approved, it will affect hundreds of workers who were not given the opportunity to speak on their behalf. Medical mandates, including those, including forced treatments or procedures, disclosed <clears throat> the disclosure of private, private medical information or subjugation to medical testing or forms of authoritative overreach and defy existing le legislation that supports the right of an employee to decline medical treatments or test, tests as a condition of employment. I'm hoping you have had time to print the document or overlook it because I've included many violations to the Canadian Charter of Rights of Freedom. Section 2 states that all Canadians have the right and freedoms of conscience, conscience and religion to protect individual rights and to make choices based on the ground free from government interference. Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms also indicates that all Canadians are entitled to the rights and freedoms of liberty and security of the person which protects their physical autonomy from government interference. I've also included violation of the Personal Information Protective Act, which is additionally concerning with this policy as its unreasonable nature of which personal medical information is going to be collected. Forced medical disclosure is, as a condition of employment is not consent and is in direct violation of Section 7 of the Personal Information Protection Act. Furthermore, Section 7 of PIPA stipulates, should an organization attempt to gain consent through false, deceptive, or misleading practices, as through the threat of employment or discipline, that such consent becomes void. Section 5 of the Employment Equity Act states, employers shall implement employment equity by identifying and eliminating employment barriers against person in de persons in designated groups that result from the employer's employment systems, policies, practices that are not authorized by law. Most concerning of the proposed COVID vaccination and rapid test policy is the threat of loss of employment for those who do not comply, which should be perceived as a violation of the Criminal Code of Canada, including extortion and intimidation. 
Any policy that requires COVID-19 vaccinations at this point is contravening the Nuremberg Code and the Declaration of Helsinki. All COVID-19 vaccinations are newly developed products, which are still in clinical trials until May 2nd, 2023. <clears throat> Canada is a signer on the Nuremberg Code, and the Nuremberg Code states that medical ex experiments conducted on human beings require voluntary informed consent. The Declaration of Helsinki states medical research on human subjects, considerations related to the well-being of the human subject should take precedent over the interests of science and society. Requiring employees to take an experimental vaccine for a novel virus that has not been in existence for more than two years is a very clear violation of both the Nuremberg Code and the Declaration of Helsinki. We have also asked that the city and council supply us with a little bit more information before considering the approval of this policy. Some questions that we would like answered are why does the proposed policy ignore natural immunity? There are hundreds of research studies from reputable institutions that confirm natural immunity to COVID is equal to or superior to vac vaccine immunity. We would also like to know why that it states that vaccination is the best defense against the virus when statistical data has shown that case rates are both in the vaccinated and unvaccinated. <clears throat> it's extremely important to highlight the fact that COVID-19 vaccines are current, that are currently available do not prevent an individual from getting COVID, nor do they stop transmission. They have only been shown to reduce the severity of symptoms in the person who received it. It does not act as a protective mechanism for others as the virus is still transmissible by the vaccinated. We would also like to know why there has been a complete disregard involving with the COVID vaccines of who will be liable if there are any injuries, which can include death. Reports of adverse reactions are increasing throughout the world. In Canada alone, our adverse events of special interest state have 16,578 reports already and 5,653 of them are considered serious. A Pilgrim, the Harvard Pilgrim study suggests that fewer than one vaccine adverse reactions are actually reported. In regards to the risks, we would like to know that if our employer is it will accept all liability for any revert, adverse reactions that we as employees may suffer as a result of taking these vaccines. We would also like to know why at this time, given that we've had, we've not had a policy in the last 18 months and we've survived four um, waves now, why now? As of November 8th, there have been 33,155 deaths in all of Alberta. The survival rate for COVID in Alberta based on the entire population is 99.93%, almost 100% survival rate. So why is this policy being trying to be implemented? I've also included in my documents um, the age categories and the percentages of deaths and hospitalizations. <clears throat> For Alberta, hospital admittance is 0.06 of the entire population. The data also shows that COVID is drastically more deadly with age. It seems as though we are treating this as a one-size-fits-all and every person has the same level of risk, which is just untrue. Statistics Canada states that 100% of COVID deaths involving Canadians under the age of 45 had at least one disease or comorbidity. So we would also like that our one of our last questions is we would like to know why employees that are unable or choose not to be vaccinated will be subjected to mandatory rapid testing. 
All authorized rapid antigen tests currently used in Canada contain a sterilization agent called ethylene oxide, which is a known toxic chemical. The potential health effects of ethylene oxide include inhalation, which can be very toxic, skin contact, which is corrosive, long-lasting chronic exposure can lead to skin conditions, it is considered a carcinogen and may cause cancer, it may harm unborn children, and it may cause reproductive effects. It is also a mutagen that may cause genetic damage. Requiring an employee to be tested every 72 hours with a toxic chemical that has real potential to cause serious health effects over a long term is not a reasonable accommodation, as this policy states. As stated in the legal documents that the city provided with the policy, on page three, paragraph one, it stated that some employers also allow employees to take regular rapid tests, but that concept appears to be phasing out quickly. And frankly, ongoing quick testing is expensive and raises several privacy concerns. That was a statement made by the lawyer that the city provided. Hi, uh, Ms. Dirksen, I'm not trying to rush you, but I just want to allow time for nope. questions from council. So if if you wouldn't sure. mind sort of just wrapping up and that, that'll allow some time from uh, if there's any questions from council. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, the last thing that I will talk on Give me one second here. The last thing I want to talk on is July 12th, our premier was quoted stating that Alberta will not in, not have vaccine mandates. They are serious ethical, privacy, and constitutional concerns. And given that the, re, uh, sorry, the uh, redemption or restrictions exemption program that was put in place excludes workers of businesses applying for that program shows that our government is fully aware of the legalities regarding vaccine mandates, and they have taken a step back, not included themselves in this, and left it up to businesses to have to deal with the brunt of what could come from vaccine mandates. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks for your presentation. And I'm going to ask Council if they can use uh, the speaker's queue if they want to get into the queue for questions. There's a um, time for questions now. I see Councillor Thiessen. Uh, just for the new council, uh, speakers, of course, is just this little box here. It goes right to the mayor. Uh, thanks for coming in, uh, Reagan, and uh, and uh, speaking to us. Uh, shows a lot of great courage, especially since you're also speaking to your employer as well here. So thank you for that. Um, uh, quick question. Uh, when we sent that survey out uh, requesting whether or not uh, city staff were vaccinated, was there any indication that the city was in the process of developing a mandatory vaccine and testing policy in that email that went out with the survey? Ms. Dirksen? There, to Council Heapson, uh, there wasn't any specific thing stating that this would be for a uh, vaccine mandate, but we assumed that's what was coming as the city of Edmonton did the exact same thing, sent a survey out and then a few weeks later, rolled out their vaccination men policy. Okay, so you weren't you weren't given notification uh, in that initial survey? No, we received our email on Thursday the 4th saying that this will be brought to council today. And probably pass for the 15th. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Blackmore. Uh, yes, hi, Reagan. Uh, several times throughout your presentation today, you used the word we, um, and I look, I've looked at your email and, and I don't see any names attached to it. I'm wondering who, who you mean when you say we, uh, if you have a specific group of people you're talking about or you're representing a number of employees. Yes, uh, so as stated in the first line, uh, I'm representing dozens of other city of Grand Prairie employees who wish to remain anonymous at this time, just because we're not really sure if there will be discipline following speaking out like this. 
I don't think that there will be concerns of discipline coming forward to council. Any member of the public can come forward to council at any time. And uh, I, I don't see that as a concern. But what I do can see, see as a concern is the anonymous we. Um, you know, that could mean three people. It could mean 108 people. It could mean 742. Um, it doesn't give us a very accurate idea of who's coming forward if we don't know at least um, some idea of who that collective we is. Personally, I've spoken to probably around 40 people. Okay. Just myself. Thank you for that. Anything further, Councillor Blackmore? Uh, Councillor, nope. All right. Okay. I do not see any further questions. I actually have one question for you, Ms. Dirksen. Uh, you referenced um, questions that you were looking for from the organization as your employer. Did you email those questions to anybody? And, and if so, did you not get answers? I have not. Um, I just finished this last night and I was hoping to see today who is speaking so that I may forward this to that person at the city. Okay. Thank you for that. I see nothing further. So thank you for your time today. I appreciate you uh, coming out and I appreciate, oh, I, Sorry, sorry, I apologize, I didn't see you. There we go, Councillor Bosch has a question for you. Hi, Reagan, thank you for uh, speaking out for you and the people that you are uh, uh, speaking out for, for lack of better words. You had uh, commented that government interference is um, illegal. Has any of your, um, have you or anybody else who has the same feelings of you done any homework or research on how the federal government has passed this through with zero uh, contemplation for uh, rapid testing? Surely I would think that there has to be some sort of um, government um, look into the human rights and freedoms on our federal level. So I'm curious if you or anyone else that stands as you do has looked into that aspect. Ms. Dirksen? I've looked into it. I've looked into it a little bit. Um, what I'm finding is despite the federal government stating it is implementing a vaccine mandate, the employees that are exempt are numerous in the tens of thousands. And it seems as though every single organization including the federal government hasn't actually implemented this yet and they're basing it on compliance we haven't seen any lawsuits have have been finalized there, there hasn't been anything yet we're kind of in a state of limbo and no decision has actually ever been made as of today okay reagan thank you for your answer all right, I don't see anybody else in the queue. So thank you again for your time today. Um, and if you wish to stay on and watch, absolutely, you're more than welcome to. I just ask that you turn your camera off so I can get to the next delegation. Next under thank delegations, you. I have uh, Chulpan Young. Um, if you would like to turn your camera on, introduce yourself, um, same process as Ms. Dirksen, five to seven minutes to present, and then an opportunity for council to ask questions. Okay, I'll just ask one more time, Chilpan Young. I don't, we don't think you're on the call, but I'll just double check. Moving along then to the third delegation, Sean McLean. Sean, if you're on the call, if you could please turn on your camera and um, we will turn the mic over to you once your camera's turned on. being blocked. Somebody's going to admit you. Give me one second. There we go. Perfect. Mr. Young, or Mr. McLean, rather, uh, thank you for attending today. Um, five to seven minutes for presentation, please, and then I'll allow questions uh, from Council. Please go ahead. If you could just introduce yourself for those who are watching. Certainly. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to Council. Um, my name is Sean McLean. I was uh, the recent PPC uh, candidate in the last federal election for the area here. Um, and I have had several people actually come to me, uh, some of them actually from the city itself, um, 
wanting that that also wanted to remain anonymous. I want to congratulate Ms. Dirch on her on her um, courage and being able to kind of come forward because as as we well know, it can be very difficult. Um, and, and our society today, with the single narrative that we've got from our federal government, uh, and uh, we we see um, punitive actions on people that do stand up. Uh, the uh, Conservative Party of Canada were kicking people out that did not follow the narrative. I mean, there's been governments and, and things happening like this all over the place. So um, our biggest problem in our country right now is fear. Um, the fear of a, a virus right now that has, uh, like Ms. Dirksen pointed out, a 0.9% mortality rate. Um, this is insane. And uh, what we're seeing is governments at every level, including the municipal level, uh, following in, uh, the footsteps of the federal government, uh, looking for legal narrative or legal runarounds to uh, provide um, vaccine passports, um, mandatory vaccinations, and, and it's all done through innuendo. Uh, as again, Ms. Dirksen pointed out, a lot of this stuff isn't even being implemented. It's being uh, imposed upon us. Um, as people, um, we are being told that we cannot participate in society if we are not vaccinated. Uh, which makes no sense uh, for a virus that everybody is a transmitter. Um, the policy that I that I read within, um, as I understand it, is going to require that the city uh, puts forward uh, vaccine tests to the unvaccinated, which in and of itself is discriminatory, um, and it's actually unsafe. Because as we all know, if the 77% of Canadians that are, are vaccinated actually do transmit virus and they're not required to uh, take these tests, what you're actually doing is you're promoting the idea that 77% of your workforce can come in and infect the unvaccinated people that don't trust the vaccine or don't trust the government pushing it. Um, that in itself is unconscionable. Uh, you are putting people at risk by doing this. Um, Israel, which is one of the most vaccinated countries in the world, um, had 667 deaths between August 10th and September 9th, I believe it was. No, September 8th, sorry. 277 of those people were unvaccinated that died. 308 were vaccinated, and another 83 were vaccinated with a booster shot. That's almost 60% of the people that died in Israel, who's the most vaccinated country in the world, almost 60% were the vaccinated people. So we have to ask the questions. And that's the problem that we're having. That's what people are frustrated with these days, is you're not allowed to ask the questions. Doctors and healthcare practitioners that are asking these questions are, are summarily being uh, dismissed. Um, these are people that have spent years dedicating their lives to serving people, educating themselves. But because it does not fit in a single narrative, we as a people are, are shutting down discussion. And when we do that, we are basically taking away um, what it means to be Canadian, living in a free country. It's unconscionable. And we need leaders in order to be able to stand up. Uh, and say, you know what, this is wrong. You know, I, uh, you know, as a council member, as a mayor, I am not going to look at this and and, and support it. You know, um, it's uncomfortable. Like Miss Nerkson stood up. It, nobody wants to do it. I don't want to do it. I, I had the same thing within my company. Um, and, and it's not a very comfortable thing. But why do we have to be the ones standing up? We're electing people um, such as those on the council and the mayor to stand up for us, stand up for our rights. Do not look at the legal runarounds that the province and the federal government are trying to do to get away from taking away people's rights and freedoms. So um, to that end, um, that's, that's pretty much uh, the, the crux of what it was that uh, I've been asked to kind of represent. Um, and, and do I think that people are uh, going out of their way to try and harm people? No, absolutely not. But what people are doing is they're allowing fear, propaganda of sorts, where, where one narrative is the only way to go. And that's just wrong. That's not the way we do things in Canada. We need councillors and the mayors to stand up against our problems and say, you know what, this is wrong. Our people do not want that. When you ask the questions, uh, councillor, where uh, you know, you're not seeing the numbers of people, you're, you're, you're 
you're concerned about the anonymity, there's a reason for that. It's the fear. It's the alienation. It's the segregation. And it's the discrimination. People are afraid. They don't want to come talk to you because they're, uh, they're, they're seeing all over the country where people that do come up and stand up are losing their jobs. This is something um, of, of a bigger note, and it needs to be stood up to by the people that, that have been elected to uh, represent the people of Grand Prairie, Alberta, and of Canada. So, with that, I'll end right there. If there's any questions, feel free to uh, shoot, at, shoot them up. Great. Thanks for that, Mr. McLean. I will open it up to Council. I see Councillor Thiessen in the queue. Thanks, Mayor Clayton, and thanks for coming in today, uh, Mr. McLean. I uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, so uh, you did mention, and, and I think I saw your, your posters out in the election landscape uh, that you ran for the PPC party. Now, lots of PPC followers uh, are, would rail about the charter rights and human freedoms as their, their main source of protection in these types of mandates. Um, but I might argue that, in fact, the Canadian Human Rights Act is probably prescribes a lot more protection, especially in the realm of discrimination against that. How familiar are you with the Canadian Human Rights Act and where do you see it applied in, in this realm? Pretty, I basically, I see it, uh, I, I'm fairly familiar with it. It doesn't specifically mention medical uh, medical leave or medical issues. Um, the, the, the notes themselves, um, uh, the specific points, uh, gender, uh, race, all that kind of stuff, yes. Uh, getting a COVID vaccine is, uh, you know, or the medical status is not included specifically in the policy. But the, uh, the point of the policy is, is about making sure there's no discrimination. And I think you could probably agree with me that uh, by basically asking people for their, for their vaccine status and uh, separating two separate groups of people, one into um, uh, vaccinated, one into unvaccinated, to give one better privileges than the other, uh, that's discrimination. So um, that, that would be my stand on this. We, you know, um, and, and again, the, the government has done a very good job of looking at legal innuendo, legal verbiage to support its claims so that it, it looks like it's not as liable. I mean, even uh, I, I noticed in, in your documentation, you mentioned that um, uh, COVID had basically been de uh, or, uh, denoted as a, uh, a workplace hazard. Well, so it's falling off a ladder, and you use various different methods in order to uh, to deal with various different hazards. Taking away people's rights, um, and and again, whether it's determined specifically with the wording, all that necessarily means is that uh, you know they didn't think about this scenario. But discrimination is discrimination. That's just the way I look at it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. McLean. Just uh, for the record, uh, I think what you're looking for in the Canadian Human Rights Act is genetic characteristics, and it's uh, defined in the Library of Parliament. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Bosch. Thank you for uh, speaking to us as well. Um, I'm going to go back to my previous question from our last delegate, because if I asked it and didn't look at it myself, I don't think that's a, a fair question. Plus, this is information for our entire council. So November 3rd, uh, the Canadian Treasury came out uh, from the Canadian government with um, proof and evidence of what the federal government did. And so I'm talking about this without accommodations, such as we're proposing. So for about 268,000 staff, 93% are fully vaccinated. 2.1% are partially, 0.5% are unvaccinated, and 1.2% are requests for accommodation. So um, this is in reply to what um, I had asked Reagan previously. So I just, I wanted to be uh, clear on that. So um, yeah, anyway, it's it's just a comment from, from the last statement, but I didn't want to um, impose any type of um, questions that I wasn't willing to look at myself. I appreciate that. Um, and just for the record, I mean, I've had this conversation several times. Um, you know, people that are, are have bought into this single narrative um, usually use, like to use the fact that we've got such a high population of people that are vaccinated uh, as some sort of an indication that people support that. 
people don't support that. Not not as many as 77 percent. I can guarantee you that. Uh, people don't want to lose their jobs. People want to be able to travel. They want to be able to go to a restaurant without being harassed. Um, they want to live their lives like Canadians up until the vaccine basically, uh, or, or the, the, the virus started basically making people fearful, like I say, over a 0.9 mortality rate uh, virus that to, is doing more, da- uh, doing more damage with the vaccine push than it is the virus itself. Society is having trouble uh, coping with it on, on a grand scale. You're actually seeing now places like Ontario where they're backing off on uh, their their healthcare workers with the, you know, okay, you know what, we don't need you vaccinated now. We need you to take care of people. You know, people like to argue the point that uh, ICUs are filling up. I mean, of course they're filling up. When you've got a, a single narrative and you've got a lot of doctors out there that have maybe alternative medicine that could actually do something, but they're either getting fired or, or moved away from being able to treat people, um, uh, the government's pretty much creating uh, the issue and blaming it on the unvaccinated people because, uh, of course, they're going to get more uh, more people coming in there. It, it's just, you know, they're not logically doing it. They're trying to blame the people for the failing of the government in not being able to provide the support we need. Sorry. <laughs> Was I rambling? <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, I don't see anyone else in the queue. So I thank you for your time today, Mr. McLean. appreciate you letting us know and coming out as a delegation. Uh, as before I mentioned, you're more than welcome to stay, continue to watch. Uh, I just ask that you turn your camera off so I can uh, move on to the next uh, delegation. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, uh, Ms. Hillary Hill. If you're with us still, Ms. Hill, if you could just turn on your camera, let us know that you are here. Perfect. Thank you for that. If you could just introduce yourself, and as with the other two uh, delegations, uh, you know, five to seven minutes to talk, and then Council will have an opportunity for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Hillary Hill. I am a citizen of Grand Prairie, a concerned mother. I was born and raised in Grand Prairie. Um, I am also, I have started a large uh, parent group that is very against uh, mandatory anything uh, for ourselves and our children and our community. Um, And so I'm here to represent them because they have too much anxiety or they are actually very fearful of the repercussions of coming and speaking out against um, any of it really. Um, so I've kind of taken a list of all of their concerns and I'm going to bring those forward as well as my own concerns. Um, so what I really want to talk about today is how um, the implementation of the vaccine passport is um, discriminating against parents and children and all of our citizens. And these are publicly funded buildings um, that we've all as adults now paid a considerable amount of money from our working lives towards those in building them and keeping them um, operational. And so, you know, a large portion of people would like to know if we're not able to access these facilities, um, they would like to know about some sort of tax credit back um, for that. And then we would really like to know why facilities in Grand Prairie have not um, adopted the one-third capacity so that they do not have to discriminate against um, the citizens, but uh, especially um, families um, because, you know, tons of people I know cannot go watch their kids play hockey. They cannot um, participate in in, um, regular life. because of the mandate, kids are missing out on basic experiences like swimming, movies, sports, theaters, clubs, talk groups. Um, and these are all publicly funded um, facilities. And, you know, the ones that are privately funded, you know, are very much so discriminating, discriminating against the population. I've, I've received emails as a mother saying that I'm no longer welcome in, in the sex gymnastics um, club 
because they know I'm unvaccinated without them even um, asking me my vaccination status. And my daughter who attends that facility is only seven years old. So, and I know I'm not the only one who has received, uh, you know, pretty discriminatory emails and quite rude emails from facilities like that, as well as um, quite a few dance studios in town have also, um, you know, really crossed the line into making a huge divide and discriminating against people and treating them quite poorly. Um, you know, our, our local RCMP are at our, our arenas enforcing the rep program and the masks while drug addicts are doing business in the parking lot or right outside, pure, totally visible to our children. Two local mothers last week were kicked out of Wendy's downtown for simply wanting to take their two daughters out for lunch. Meanwhile, there's a drug addict sitting at a table picking through cigarette butts and drug paraphernalia. Uh, you know, at what point is, is that kind of illogical, right? Um, this is ca causing a major divide in our city um, amongst family, friends, um, our children's friends. It's making discrimination in everyday and acceptable practice. Um, I would also like to uh, talk about, um, so that's what we'd really like to see happen with the facilities in town in closing on that, is that we would like to see them drop down to one third capacity to end the discrimination going on in Grand Prairie, um, not just to Grand Prairie citizens, but all citizens coming into our town that are trying to access our facilities. Um, Another thing I'd like to talk about today is why natural immunity is not uh, being exercised. Why are we not given the right to prove our natural immunity for those of us who have already had COVID and different COVID um, variants? Um, it's not even an option for us. Um, they've also isolated a gene, MTHFR, that, that shows what... Uh, people in the population are, are the most susceptible to the coronavirus and the major, um, uh, you know, are more likely to be hospitalized. Um, if the vaxxed and unvaxxed can, can contract and spread the virus, why are passports even being enforced? Um, last time I checked, Grand Prairie had 119 active cases Therefore, really, we're not even under an emergency anymore. And Hinshaw has even stated that this shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all program. At this point, we're asking for our city council to step in and our mayor to step in and do the job we've elected you to do. You need to call the state of emergency or our town emergency over so that um, our, our residents can get back to natural life. Um, Another thing I want to talk about is why, if there's three treatments listed on the NIH uh, site, very, very, uh, anybody can access this, um, Invermectin being one of them, along with two others, um, if there's a treatment, there's no reason for an emergency anymore. So again, the passport being, being enforced is illogical. Um, you know, these um, treatments that they're trying to do. Um, I would like to talk about mental health quickly and how uh, Chris Schaefer has done a presentation at our school, the Catholic School Board, as well as you guys, I believe. And the Catholic School Board in the last meeting I listened to actually said they were the health authority now. And um, um, they have listened to him and chose to go against the actual health expert and are enforcing masks even more than what the government is. My son is being sent to the office for simply having his mask below his nose sitting, sitting at his desk. Um, you know, I could get into the air quality for that, but I'm sure you've all, you all know those statistics. But just coming into the winter now, our kids are sitting in masks on the bus because uh, the school board is enforcing that or the transportation. And they say this is an, uh, 
uh, city matter. So I would really ask that our city council look into this because these kids now with it being cold and, and they're going to have runny noses, it's just a normal thing. They're, they're sitting in uh, trapped heat, trapped moisture. It's a breeding ground for bacteria. They're damp. They're going to be damp all winter. So this is something that needs to be addressed right now and call a stop to children having to wear masks on the bus. Um, and, and all of this really wraps up into how this is affecting our mental health as a whole. Our children um, are showing major red flags. Um, they're crying more, they're talking less, they're feeling angry, guilty, helpless. They're coming numb to this situation. They're confused. It's time we pay attention to these very concerning red flags and stand up for our children and our families in this community. They have the right to feel safe and to feel supported. Children have a right to, to a safe, healthy learning environment that's not being um, um, done here in Grand Prairie, unfortunately. Um, I'd really like to see no more discrimination or divide among our, our family, friends, loved ones. Um, families are being split apart for something that shouldn't even be a thing. Um, with all the other treatments and all the um, the other ways to to kind of deal with COVID now, um, we really just need to call a stop to these mandates. I have teachers who have also asked me to come forward and speak about how it's being mandated in the school and how um, if ever if vaxxed and unvaxxed can can both. Uh, contract and spread the virus, how come teachers that are unvaxxed are being subjected to these harmful PCR tests when teachers that are vaxxed aren't going to show the symptoms and they are actually going to be spreading it around our community and our schools and everything. I mean, if you're going to test teachers, they need to be tested right across the board. The discrimination against the unvaccinated needs to stop. Um, these teachers, you know, um, lots of them I know that are unvaccinated are wonderful human beings and they are really working towards creating um, a safe, healthy learning environment and they are really the ones who are educating and, and standing up for these children and their families and I don't believe they, they deserve to be treated like this. Um, Ms. Hill, sorry. Uh, and there is lots of... Sorry, I, I just we're we're running quite behind, and so and you know it's been ample time. I'm just wondering if you had anything new to add. Just maybe uh, move to that and then wrap it up so that I can allow council some questions. Oh, no, that's pretty much all I got to say. Perfect. I think I've covered most of my topics. Thank you for that. I'll open up uh, in the QIC, Councillor Teeson. Thank you very much, Mayor Clayton, and thank you very much, Ms. Hill, for coming in and to the other two mothers I saw on the couch behind you there. Um, just a question. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, dance groups out in Sexsmith and locally uh, not allowing parents or children in because of their vaccination status. Um, do you believe that these dance groups uh, are creating their own restrictions based out of fear of losing their livelihood? because they don't know what else to do. Uh, so they're just following the imposed mandates. Um, I do believe that the government has left facilities and, and these private um, clubs kind of out there on their own. Um, so they are all going rogue and kind of implementing whatever. I mean, I've talked to Dina Hinshaw about it here in Grand Prairie when in September when they first implemented they implemented um they mis misread the rep program and they actually were implementing stricter restrictions than even the government i've talked to uh our mayor about it in september and she let me know that that it's administrative boards that actually implement or make these rules and that's really my question too is why are, are you guys leaving this up to administrative boards that, that actually make those rules for the facilities and these clubs? Like, because then these clubs are all open and liable to lawsuits. So um, I think they're just all very scared and they don't have a clear direction. And 
And I think that, you know, as our mayor and as our council, that it's time for you guys to just take the control back. They're not the health authority, you know, and I mean, I don't. No, no, I get it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I get, I hear what you're saying. This restriction exemption program is quite, quite intense for a lot of people. My personal wish is that the REP still stood for Rotary Employment Partnership through Inclusion Alberta. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Councillor Thiessen. Uh, moving on, Councillor Blackmore. Um, Mayor Jackie, you might not want to let me ask this question because it really isn't pertinent to the subject that we're really here to discuss, which is specifically the uh, city bylaw that's before us today. Uh, but I wanted to know if perhaps administration uh, could clarify the one-third rule versus REP and where it's implemented and not Im implemented in the city, as the speaker did raise that issue. Sure. Uh, let's just allow uh, questions for the delegation right now, and then I will allow questions for administration following that. Okay, I'll ask it later. Thank you. Any further questions for the delegation? Seeing none, thank you again, uh, Ms. Hill, for attending today and, and those who are supporting you. I appreciate your time and for you being here. Uh, please continue thank to you. watch. As I mentioned, uh, just ask that you turn your camera on because I do think I have one other delegation, possibly more than one. Um, there is one other delegation on screen, I understand, um, from the Association of International Firefighters. If you would like to turn your camera on right now, uh, Mr. McDonald, if you could just introduce yourself for those who are watching. And same thing, five to seven minutes and then an opportunity for questions. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. My name is Ian McDonald, and I am the president of the Grand Prairie Firefighters Association, Local 2770 of the International Association of Firefighters. <clears throat> I am here today to express our support for the COVID-19 vaccination and rapid testing policy being presented today. The International Association of Firefighters strongly encourages our members to get vaccinated and seeks to work with all levels of government in seeking solutions for those who cannot or choose not to be vaccinated for personal reasons. <clears throat> As an essential service, our members are on the front lines 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When the citizens of Grand Prairie call, we respond providing fire suppression, mortar vehicle response, technical rescue services, hazardous materials, and medical co-response services within the city of Grand Prairie. Responding to 3,000 calls in 2020 and over 3,100 year to date for 2021. Along with 911 call answer and fire dispatch for 62 departments across the northwest corner of the province, including the city of Grand Prairie, as well as fire prevention services, including inspections and permitting. The citizens of Grand Prairie rely on us to respond and mitigate their emergencies on a daily basis. The nature of our work has our members spending our time together in close proximity to one another, riding on the trucks, sharing living quarters, and training to highlight but a few. We are also in close proximity to each other and the public we serve while performing our duties. Our members in the 911 center work 12 hour shifts processing calls and providing dispatch services while in close proximity to one another as well. Our fire prevention members interact with members of the community on a daily basis, ensuring buildings and businesses are safe and up to code. We work closely with Alberta Health Service ambulance crews, providing medical co-response, and increasingly, we are providing medical first response when ambulances are not available within the city. We assist with and or provide direct medical attention to citizens in need. This includes responding to long-term care homes on a regular basis, driving and operating the ambulance, assisting with patient care in both the pre-hospital and hospital settings. This policy, takes the necessary steps to help minimize the risk of COVID-19 for our members and the citizens we serve while performing our duties and responsibilities. We ask that Council endorse the COVID-19 vaccination and rapid testing policy. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. McDonald. I'll see if there's anyone from Council that has any questions. Councillor Lerners. 
Thank you, Mr. McDonald, for your presentation today. I'm just curious, um, obviously you are involved with uh, people on a day-to-day -day in, in life-threatening situations. Um, if you were developing a policy or do you think there's room in a policy to have uh, different standards for people that interact with the public and those that don't interact, i.e. people that stay at home, or, should they, or do you have other thoughts on that? Mr. McDonald? I guess if I could ask you to rephrase your question, I just don't quite understand it in regards to um, like employee standards for us going and serving them in their homes or businesses or... No, I, I, I guess where I'm getting at is, you know, you, you made the point that um, you as firefighters are in contact with people in seniors' homes and in accidents and fires and, and so it's, you know, you would obviously don't want to be the source of a COVID-related um, incident, but... Um, I guess what I'm trying to see is, do you see room in a policy, uh, i.e. the one we're presenting, where there's where there's room for um, people that aren't involved with people to have a different standard than those that are involved with with um, people? Uh, well, I guess when I when we look at this policy, it's not a vaccine mandate. Uh, you do have the choice to not be vaccinated and do rapid testing. So. Um, for the fire department purview, we would look at it as we're allowing people who choose not to for uh, the various reasons to uh, come into work and continue working and not potentially bring COVID into the workplace and being tested on the uh, 72 hours as is spoken to in the policy. If they were to be in contact at work, um, they could then um, be tested on that regular basis. So. Um, Within the fire department, we have uh, those of us who serve into the public in the suppression side and prevention. The dispatch branch, they are contained to that room, but uh, with it not being a, a mandate, um, I believe this policy is one of the most flexible in Canada in regards to uh, employees' choices. Um, you know, in the dispatch room, um, we do have a certain staffing level um, if a COVID outbreak uh, or close contacting wherever we are in the COVID cycle uh, were to affect the room, we could lose dispatch uh, rather quickly as we don't have a high capacity. Thank you. Councillor Thiessen. Thanks, Mayor Clayton, and thank you, Mr. McDonald. Great to see you again, Ian. Uh, we always have great conversations. Uh, anyways, uh, I, I have a couple questions for you, actually three to be most specific. Um, over the time of 2020 to 2021, um, how many firefighters at, uh, at the fire halls contracted COVID-19? Mr. McDonald? Uh, well, I mean, given that's privileged uh, medical information, I couldn't give you an, an exact number, obviously, because not everything is shared when it comes to uh, employee privacy is around health matters. Uh, to my knowledge, I know of eight uh, persons who uh, shared with me that they had, um, were off for COVID related. So of, of those eight, uh, how many, how many, well, I guess it's personal information, so I won't ask you that, but of, of those eight, they're all still back at work, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so just a quick follow-up question on, on that one. Of those eight that are back at work, do we consider that that uh, since they had exposure to the COVID virus, that they now have obtained natural immunity and thereby could technically not have to qualify for a vaccine? Mr. Well, again, this policy doesn't speak to a vaccine mandate. It speaks to the option to disclose or to go to rapid testing. And um, I'm not I'm not a virologist or a scientific doctor or a doctor of any matter actually, so I can't quantify an answer in regards to natural immunity versus vaccine immunity. I'd leave that to the medical experts. Okay, so but but natural immunity you can say does exist, right? And the purpose of vaccinating I'm not, people. I'm not qualified to answer that question. I'm not a doctor. Fair enough. Um, all right. Uh, then I guess my question for you is, um, with uh, in regards to vaccine injuries, um, what 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 then? 
Like, uh, is that can you say with absolute certainty that the firefighters and yourself know for sure that if somebody uh, obtains a, a an emergent health issue in their body, that it wasn't caused by the vaccine? Well, I would default to a medical experts to determine that. Uh, the WCB has stated that um, workers who, as a result of a mandatory vaccination policy, would be covered under uh, WB, WCB legislation. And um, again, I, I can't comment on vaccine injury or if if that's a a real thing. Okay, that's that's fair. Um, so, Ian, just my last question. Uh, over the last two weeks, I've been receiving several phone calls from several different departments of the City of Grand Prairie from staff that is concerned about this policy that's coming forward here today. Whether it's mandatory or not is, I guess, up to the reader. Um, my question for you is, um, of, the, of the many co phone calls I got, I got a call from three separate firefighters. Uh, one of them is not currently working, uh, is on a leave. Um, but all of them expressed to me that um, when they said that they refused to take a vaccine and refused to take a test, at that point um, they felt that they were their staff members were belligerent to them, they were bullying, abusive, they were isolated from staff, and they didn't feel welcome. Is that the type of uh, community we want to build within our firehouses? <clears throat> well, I guess I would just caution you on your... Uh believing the narrative that could come from anyone reaching out to Councillor Thiessen. Um, I can confirm that there are people who have chosen not to do those things as you've alluded to, how they were received and or treated by their co-workers it would be a subject of great debate. Um, that's one side of the conversation and I don't believe uh, personnel issues are to be discussed by Council in public but I'd be more than willing to uh, sit down with you and discuss my knowledge of it and uh, inform you of that. Um, we work together day in, day out to make sure that we're protecting one another and the public we serve. And as we've seen in this community, the passion of this question around COVID-19 and vaccinations and vaccinations in the workplace um, I would say we're no different than any other family or community where we all have our passions and how those are received or interpreted is up to great interpretation and um, people want the best for each other and sometimes that comes in different forms, but um, I have never witnessed open hostility and or um, spiteful actions on purpose in regards to this matter. Okay, thank you. Councillor Berg. Uh, Mr. McDonald, uh, a similar question that Councillor Blackmore had asked earlier uh, of a previous delegation is, can you tell us how many people you represent? And outside of that, how many people, to your knowledge, uh, are in favour or against? Well, our membership uh, currently sits at 87 individuals across uh, three branches in the department. Um, I can uh, confirm that I would have overwhelming support from my membership in regards to this uh, policy being uh, received. Obviously, as uh, Councillor Thiessen uh, spoke to, there are people who, who don't agree with this. Um, when the policy was presented last Thursday, we did have a, a regularly scheduled membership meeting uh, that evening. Uh, we have our meetings uh, via Zoom uh, with the various measures in place right now. So attendance is quite easy. We had an attendance of 50 plus members. We received one question in regards to process for the policy. I have received zero correspondence from anybody not in favor of this policy from my membership. I have received uh, upwards of 24 texts and emails from members uh, hoping that the policy does move forward and that we can have some consistency in uh, workplace uh, COVID uh, precautions. Thank you. 
for that, uh, Mr. McDonald. I don't see anyone else in the queue, so I thank you for your time. Appreciate you coming out today. I am aware of one, and uh, sorry, Mr. McDonald, as mentioned, um, please stay around, join us. Great, you've turned your camera off. I see one more delegation in the queue. If you could please uh, turn on your camera and introduce yourself. If there's anyone else in the uh, on on the call who would like to speak, now is the time. And oh, sorry, I apologize. Apparently, we have one more delegation who is just signing in. Sure, I'll give it one more minute just because it's a little bit. Uh, Mr. Fabian, I understand you wish to speak to council. Please, perfect. Thank you for turning your camera on. Uh, please introduce yourself for those who are watching and, and same uh, process, five to seven minutes and then an opportunity for council to speak. Thank you. Go ahead, sir, if you are ready to go. Oh, I just need to unmute you to unmute. Not yet. Just hover down the bottom left of your screen. There should be a mute button. Bottom left hand corner. Just working through to see if we can get some audio. It's going to try a different computer. All right, so um, go ahead, Mr. Fabian, and try to connect with us again. I'm going to move on um, from delegations. I'm not aware of any other delegations that are here today. Uh, just give me a minute to, to sign back into my eScribe. So, to my knowledge, that concludes delegations. I am going to now allow time um, for, uh, there was one council question for administration um, for, from Ms. Blackmore, and then I'll double check, uh, then I'll check back with the delegation. If you'd like to go ahead, uh, Councillor Blackmore. Yes, hi, I had asked the question if administration could uh, define the difference between one third capacity versus the REP, uh, because I think that there's some confusion about the limitations around one third capacity based on the earlier presentation. So I'll look to CAO Galante to see who you'd like to take that question. I know Director Miller is the one who's dealt with most. Yeah, I think Director Miller will have the um, number of facilities as well. Uh, that are currently under the um, uh, REP program versus one third because we have a, a mix of them in the city. Um, and I can speak then as well about the, the, uh, the reasoning behind that. But um, Arlen, if you want to proceed with the, uh, um, the, the facilities currently under which, uh, which program. All right. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. So uh, <clears throat> currently under the REP, we have uh, CKC, which includes Eastlink and the Coke Centre as well, the Twin Ice Arenas, uh, the museum, and uh, the Heritage Discovery Centre, the Leisure Centre, Day Bar, Bonnet Centre, and uh, the Bose Centre are all under the REP. And then under one third, it's the uh, Ernie Radborn Pavilion, MCC, which includes uh, the library, the art gallery, as well as uh, Teresa Sargent Hall. And then South Bear Creek Pavilion is under one third, and uh, the community gyms that we, uh, we rent out to different groups are under one third as well. 
and uh, Center 2000 is under one third. And uh, I guess one exception with the community gyms, if the group, the renting group, uh, decides they want to implement the REP for the sport they're participating in, they can certainly do that as well. Uh, I guess the main, like the difference between the two is uh, one third. It's one third capacity for uh, spectators as, and uh, participants as well. And uh, what we have heard is that for some sports where parents like to uh, watch their kids play hockey or different activities, the one third restricts how many parents or how many relatives can, or friends can go and watch the activity. And uh, REP doesn't, uh, as long as you're vaccinated or have a recent rapid test, there's no restriction on the numbers. And uh, you know, that's the biggest uh, difference, I guess. But I was, we can find out additional details unless the city manager wants to add uh, additional comments. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're correct, uh, Director Miller. Uh, the decision to establish some facilities under uh, restriction exemption program versus one third capacity of the fire code was to maximize the use of the facilities. Uh, regulations are centrally complex and, and evolving pretty much every week. So when the, the province launched those both programs, uh, we analyzed the uh, latest set of uh, rules and we tried to maximize the usage uh, for youth, you know, for, for, for young populations, for uh, organized sports and trying to get as many um, users on, on our facilities. So that was kind of the main rationale behind that. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Councillor Blackmore? Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you, Mayor Clayton. Just while we're talking about that, I know that the one-third capacity often gets uh, talked about, but there's other restrictions on top of the one-third capacity if we're not in the re restriction exemption program, if I'm remembering correctly. Could you just refresh everybody's mind about what on top of one third capacity we need to observe if we're not part of the REP program? Sure. Uh, Director Miller, I'm assuming Council Bressy is referring to things such as lack of adult, um, adult sports not being allowed, et cetera. Are you able to elaborate on that? Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. Uh, another example, I guess, would be uh, the storm cannot play if we had the one third uh, program at, at Bonnet's uh, Energy Center. So. Uh, They'd have to, they had to, uh, as part of being part of the league, they had to confirm that our facility was taking part in uh, the REP. And uh, when we were assessing as well, we did connect with some user groups and uh, trying to analyze the impact. One example is minor hockey. We, uh, we dealt with them. We, and basically the message from them is we'll make it work whatever uh, the city decides, if it's one-third or if it's uh, the REP program. So, so we did do some consultation and, uh, and like the city manager said, we, we tried to do our best to, uh, to maximize use and uh, keep in mind the safety of staff as well as uh, people using the facilities. So. CAO Galante. I could comment in, uh, in addition to the uh, um, uh, measures Director Miller um, stated, uh, under the one third capacity rule, also we have to maintain physical distancing. So it's a proper separation for spectators, users of facilities, which, um, you know, creates challenges with, with occupancy again. Uh, so we're trying to maximize the, um, um, the, the uses of the facility. That's the decision to, uh, to put, for example, East Link Center on under the REP program. Thanks. Thank you for that. Does that answer your question, Councilor Bressy? All right, uh, I see no one else in the queue. I did a qu have a question for Director Miller. Um, CAO Galante just referenced the uh, maximizing the space of the facility based on um, the programs that are specific to each facility. I'm curious, um, what do the numbers look like in our facilities, for example, at Eastlink? Um, have we um, been maximizing our space uh, on a regular basis based on running the current REP program? Um, are we, you know, are we filling our time slots? What does that look like? Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me this afternoon. I, I apologize for not bringing that, but we haven't uh, maximized. We've uh, been doing okay on the numbers, but I have checked with Angela Redding in the past. And under the, the one third, we could certainly, uh, we'd probably have more folks or more clients attending the facilities, but uh, you know, we, it's an ongoing process. We are watching the numbers, seeing how many uh, are showing up, how many memberships we're losing, I guess, and how many we're gaining. We, are, we have received some feedback on both sides. Some are 
canceling memberships, others are buying memberships because we have the REP in place. Just saying it is a safer environment for them. So, so there's pros and cons to both. Sorry, I just have one more follow up on that. If somebody has bought um, a, not a monthly membership, which I'm assuming they can cancel without penalty if they choose to based on the current health measures, if they've pre-bought any um, passes, um, they're, they're eligible to have their money refunded? Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. Yes, absolutely. We've uh, been very accommodating with uh, whatever the client wants. Perfect. Thank you for that. All right. I see no one else in the queue. I'm thinking uh, Mr. Fabiano, I think your last name was, if you're able to turn on your audio now, um, looks like you are, um, I'll allow, you know, five to seven minutes for your presentation and then counsel an opportunity to ask you questions. If you could please introduce yourself for those who are watching. Hi. Hello. That computer out here. My name is Jeremy Fabian, and I've been working for the City of Grand Prairie as a firefighter since 2000, July 2009. I've dedicated the last 12 years to serving the citizens of Grand Prairie and striving to be the best leader I can be for the, be for the Grand Prairie Fire Department. I'm currently next for promotion to Lieutenant, and I am the team lead for the Critical Incident Stress Management Peer Support Team. I sit on the Provincial CISM Peer Support Advisory Council, and I also teach multiple disciplines as a subject matter expert. I'm writing you to you today, or I'm speaking to you today, having never thought in my wildest dreams I would be fighting for my freedoms in Canada, and possibly fighting for my career. But here we are, living in a city, province, and country that has created a two-tier society in the name of safety. When only a year ago, the mention of vaccine mandates, vaccine passports were classified as conspiracy theories. I will start by talking about the last email sent to all city employees regarding the coalition of inclusive municipalities. The city of Grand Prairie is working on equity, diversity and inclusion initiatives as part of our commitment as a signatory to the coalition of inclusive municipalities. Because it values and respects all its members, an inclusive municipality builds a society without fences, where everyone has an equal chance at participating in its economic, political, social, cultural, and recreational life, and to thrive there. I hope you can appreciate the irony and hypocrisy of this email survey when currently behind the scenes, you're working on a policy to make the COVID-19 vaccine mandatory for all employees or rapid testing only for the unvaccinated. Unfortunately, with your decision to implement the provincial restrictions exemption program, in the city you have already failed to honor the fundamental principles of the coalition of inclusion. Fences have been built, equal opportunities have been taken away and taxpaying parents now need to pay extra ongoing testing costs to watch their children's recreation. This is an egregious reality. When citizens are already struggling mentally and financially, the city chose segregation rather than to pursue inclusive options. With regards to your current development of a vaccine rapid testing mandate for all unvaccinated city employees, what is the overall goal, goal for this policy? Does proper PPE work? Should you not test all employees as the vaccine efficacy wanes and is now proven that it does not stop transmission or infection? Why are you not recognizing the protection acquired from natural immunity? With over 100 studies conducted, that shows previous infection individuals have robust protection from COVID-19. One large op observational study in particular was conducted in Israel that compared the risk of infection between fully vaccinated COVID-19 people and those who had been previously infected. COVID-19 vaccines had a 13-fold increased risk of infection associated with the Delta variant than those previously infected and unvaccinated. As a firefighter, I understand the risks of COVID. I personally was inf infected with Delta variant in September and recovered well. My entire family, wife and four kids have been infected in the last year with mild symptoms and have also recovered. 
yet I am possibly facing a mandatory vaccine testing policy to keep my job, even though I have natural immunity. Why would I have entertained, why would I even entertain the increased risk of an adverse reaction to the vaccine when I have natural immunity? Just in the last few weeks, we have had at least three members fully vaccinated get infected with COVID. How is this policy going to keep us and our customers safe? You need to trust your employees to stay home when they are sick and realize we are not going to vaccinate our way out of this pandemic. I want to share with you the main reason why I'm against vaccine mandates. Firstly, I think everyone should be given the right to choose what goes in their bodies. Like anything in life, we are always making calculated decisions, weighing our personal risk versus reward benefits. As soon as I submit my health rights to, the, to my employer, what is going to stop further mandates being imposed, i.e. boosters? When did employers become involved in our medical decision making? How are you qualified to make such blanket demands? Medical autonomy is a fundamental human right that once it is relinquished, it will be lost forever. This is a dangerous precedent. Do you remember when the in the name of safety, toothpaste, nail clippers, belts and shoes had to be removed in order to get on an airplane? 20 years has gone by and I still take off my shoes, belt, hand over my nail clippers and end up throwing out my toothpaste. I have been told that I have a choice, but when my livelihood is being dangled over my head, it is no longer a choice, but coercion. I am in support of everyone's freedom to choose. If people want to be vaccinated, they should have the opportunity. Let each individual make that choice. However, public health mandates that push a one size fits all medical ex expectation on its entire population are frankly unconscionable. Tying those expectations to a citizen's ability to exercise their human rights are inhumane and morally wrong. I will finish with a personal experience. In 2010, we were continuing with our four kids vaccinations. Our daughter, Emery, was behind on her vaccine schedule due to moving and life circumstances. We were pressured by the public health nurse to catch, up, to catch her up and vaccinate both six months and 12 month shots at that appointment. Against our better judgment, we listened and she received the doses. Within 10 days, she developed hives. They were mild at first, but with each passing day, they grew and soon her body were soon over her whole body was covered with hives without relief. She was two years old. It took six months to see a specialist and he diagnosed her with chronic idiopathic urticaria and advised that her body was dealing with a virus and that it would resolve within time. We asked every medical professional we encountered if the vaccine could be involved in her condition. And we are told repeatedly and confidently, no, there was no relationship. We should continue with her vaccination schedule. We had on ominous feeling about ultimately choosing to trust the experts and vaccinate her again. It was at this point that her all hell broke loose in her little body. Within the exact same time frame as her previous shots, her entire body swelled up and hives became intense. Every inch of her was covered in intensely itchy welts, growing in severity every day to the point where they were the size of an adult palm and would bruise every 24 hours with fresh hives would appear on top. We helplessly watched our child suffer intense pain and discomfort. She couldn't sleep, focus or sit still. Every moment was painful. We watched her joyful personality fade into depression. She was three years old. There was no explanation for her condition, no answers, only upsetting conversations with doctors discussing quality of life factors as we made decisions about drug options that would have permanently repercussions on her organs. After many months, her body did eventually stop attacking itself. But in the last two years, in the last two years, it has resurfaced and manifests through multiple joint swelling and chronic hives. I have had to carry my now 12 year old daughter out of a city hockey rink after practice because her swollen joints wouldn't allow her to walk on her own. Currently, she is in active autoimmunity, although her symptoms are managed. Today, she is okay, but we have lived through two experiences that have taught us how fragile that is and to not take her health for granted. She has, had, 
She has had and recovered from COVID-19 and now has natural immunity. She is not a risk to the community, but somehow we now live in a world where the community is a risk to her. She is being shuttered from the facilities, businesses, activities of this community that our taxpayers, that we have taxpayers for. As a beautiful, happy pre-teen, she is excluded from going and hanging out with friends in city facilities. She is a talented athlete that had to quit hockey this year as it is being mandated out of and is being mandated out of other sports as well. The risk of vaccine to her is way too high and medical exemptions are almost impossible to get. In her body responded to the shot in the way it has previously, she wouldn't be able to participate in the world anyways. How do you justify the removal of community members like her in the wake of these mandates? She is one of many who are being thrown away into a medical underclass of vulnerable people who should be considered and accommodated for, not rejected and segregated. Her life and lives like her are not an acceptable level of collateral damage on this road out of this pandemic. And the city does not have the right to decide who of us has value and who doesn't. Thank you for taking the time uh, for listening to my concerns but our perspective of this vaccine mandates and vaccine passports are a much greater threat to our community than COVID. Historically, segregations never end well. If the city continues to move forward with these policies, it will be complicit in the intentional marginalization and oppression of its own citizens, while also setting dangerous examples for the future. This is the wrong path. Now, I do also wanna recognize that I am thankful that the city has taken a much more flexible position than a lot of other cities have. And so I am very thankful for that and that I will probably not lose my job, but I still think there are a lot of things that need to be answered. Thank you. Thank you for that. I will open it up to questions. I see no one in the queue. So that concludes our delegation portion of this meeting. Thank you to everyone that took the time to present to council today. Uh, we truly appreciate uh, your perspective and you to take the time to uh, jump on with us today. I'm now going to turn the uh, presentation portion. Apologies, I'm just going to get into my Zoom here. No. There we go. Thank you for that. Uh, now turning it over to the administrative report, I'll turn it over to Mr. D'Souza, the HR manager, and CAO Galante uh, has an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, I will do a brief introduction of the topic uh, that we have in front of you today. And our HR manager, Sheldon D'Souza, will provide uh, more details. And Sheldon has a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so we're here today to discuss publicly the uh, vaccination and rapid testing policy. Um, with, the, with the ultimate goal of preserving the hospital capacity and uh, ICU beds, um, and avoiding hospitals being overwhelmed. Um, over the last few months, there has been a strong emphasis yeah. on getting the majority of the population vaccinated. We have seen different degrees of mandates from the federal government to the provincial government and local governments regarding the use of vaccines and rapid tests um, as means to access a variety of venues and activities across Canada and around the world. Although many municipalities uh, issued mandatory orders um, uh, related to city employees uh, to get vaccinated over the last um, two to three months, we decided to take uh, a very cautious approach. Um, and we have spent significant time researching and communicating with other municipalities to better understand the impact of certain decisions. After analyzing multiple factors, the proposal that our HR manager, Mr. D'Souza, will, will explain to Council today, considers a very prudent approach, providing flexibility to our employees. This is not a mandatory policy. So without mandating the, mandating the use of vaccines, and we're allowing uh, options to get vaccinated or to undertake rapid testing in order to remain active in our workforce, engaged 
and productive in our workplace. Our ultimate goal here is, for, is not to um, mandate this so people can remain employed with the city. The administrative report attached to this agenda is certainly very comprehensive. You have the opportunity to, to read it. And Sheldon will provide more details um, about the proposal. And we really appreciate Council's discussion and feedback about this important matter. As this pandemic affects not only city employees, but society as a whole. And there are many different perspectives and opinions to be considered. So Sheldon, if you're ready, uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, thank you for your time today to discuss the city's COVID-19 vaccination and rapid testing policy. My name is Sheldon D'Souza, and I am the human resource manager for the city in charge of human resources and health and safety. So today I'll be talking about our vaccination and rapid testing policy, which is not to be confused with the mandatory vaccination policy, as our city manager has stated. Our policy will give our employees the choice to be fully vaccinated or undergo rapid testing. In creating this policy, we really considered our unvaccinated employees and our vaccinated employees. Understanding that unvaccinated and vaccinated employees' opinions are very polarized on the subject, we pulled the best parts of other municipalities' policy and left out the more controversial pieces like mandatory vaccinations and no rapid testing options. The policy reflects a very reasonable approach to vaccination, and our research would say it is one of the most reasonable policies in Alberta, maybe Canada. Considering we are also allowing rapid testing and covering the first three months of rapid testing, it's important to note that the city's research on vaccination policies came from recommendations from the Government of Alberta, the Minister of Health, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Occupational Health and Safety, Alberta Health Services, and legal professionals. We made sure that our research was from credible sources before creating this policy, and it's important to note that these recommendations are coming from the top professionals in our respective industries. Next slide. All right now going over some key points, this slide will explain uh, what we considered before creating this policy. So consistency with others. Our research has concluded that other municipal, regional, and public sectors have already implemented vaccination policies. A particular emphasis on our municipal sector has shown that we are one of the last mid-sized cities to implement a vaccination policy. Support to our healthcare system. As many of you are aware, Alberta canceled an estimated 15,000 surgeries as it scrambled to preserve healthcare capacity during the fourth wave of COVID-19. The, the, the province health minister quoted, I indicated that we postponed, unfortunately, roughly 15,000 surgeries. To put that into context, in the first three waves, 30,000 surgeries were postponed. We are all aware of the pressures that face our healthcare system, and this policy supports our healthcare systems by reducing hospitalization, ambulance care visits, and medical intervention in our workforce. Flexible policy. 
So as mentioned before, the policy considers unvaccinated and vaccinated staff. We took the best parts of other policies and created a policy that is flexible and adaptable to future change. The policy and procedure implemented gives all employees a choice to either demonstrate fully vaccination status or to provide regular proof of negative COVID-19 rapid results. As a result, no one will be forced to be vaccinated. Furthermore, the city is providing three months of rapid testing paid for by the employer. This makes the policy one of the most reasonable policies in Alberta. And the true test on a policy to see if the policy is infringing on employees' rights or if the policy is reasonable or unreasonable. Health and safety. Justification Justification for imposing a vaccination and rapid testing policy for the city is based on an employer's obligation under Occupational Health and Safety Act to maintain a safe and healthy work environment for all our employees. Occupational Health and Safety has deemed COVID-19 to be a workplace hazard and has identified the need for employers to implement hazard controls. Occupational Health and Safety has also identified vaccinations as being the best control on the hazard. Our number one responsibility is to keep our employees safe and vaccination and rapid testing are the controls that have been identified. If you were to assess risk on a policy, remember the greater risk for the city would be if we were to ignore the recommendations of our government health officials and fail to adopt a policy or procedure like this to protect the health and safety of our workforce. We know that there have been employees who have died from COVID in other municipalities. Strong support for policy from employees and unions. There has been a lot of pressure from our employees and unions to implement a vaccination policy to protect our staff. We also know that the RCMP have implemented a mandatory vaccination policy and that has affected our municipal staff working in that area already. Our unions have pushed to get a vaccination policy and their, na and their national unions have all expressed that vaccinations are safe and that they support vaccinations demonstrated in Appendix C, G and H. There's been a strong support for policy from the province and Alberta Health Services. We have received a letter from the Minister of Health and the Minister of Community and Social Services asking municipalities to consider implementing COVID-19 vaccination policies for employees. We also received a letter from Alberta Health Services strongly encouraging first responders to be fully vaccinated. The city operates within the province of Alberta and it is appropriate and reasonable for the city to rely on expertise, direction, rules and recommendations of the Government of Alberta, the Minister of Health and the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Operational impacts. So from the start of COVID until June of this year, we have had a number of employees who were COVID positive and numerous close contacts on our city. These employees were spread across a number of different departments and had direct operational impact on our labor force. Strong legal policy. Because of the flexibility of this policy and the option of rapid testing or vaccination, the city's policy has a strong legal backing. The courts will look to see if a policy is reasonable or unreasonable, and that makes up a big part of determining if the policy is infringing on employees' rights. As stated before, our policy is one of the most reasonable policies in Alberta. The city has sought legal opinions numerous legal opinions on human rights, charter of rights and freedoms, OH li OHS liabilities, privacy, Bill S-201, employment risks, and civil liabilities. Based on our legal opinions, it was determined that the city's policy does not violate any of these statutes. There has been several arbitration cases considering mandatory rapid COVID-19 testing in workplaces. Arbitrators have upheld mandatory COVID-19 testing policies, concluding that they fairly that uh, they fairly balance employee privacy and bodily autonomy interests. Given this, 
it is increasingly unlikely that an arbitrator would overturn a required a, a requirement for regular COVID-19 testing. To put the, legal, the legality of our policy into context, the Alberta courts, where anyone making these arguments would claim against the city for violating these rights, have a vaccination or rapid testing policy that is more restrictive and demanding than ours. Next slide. So the following slides highlight the different sectors that have implemented a vaccination policy. Our mid-sized city comparators particularly have a vaccination policy. Those include Airdrie, Lethbridge, Red Deer, St. Albert, and Strathcona. Our policy is not as harsh as other municipalities and as mentioned is more reasonable than most municipalities. We also can see that our community's fully vaccination rates in Grand Prairie are lower than the ones listed here. Next slide. So quickly, our regional comparators have started to implement a vaccination policy, as you can see here. I won't spend too much time on this slide as your packages have this in, uh, information contained within it. Next slide. Our public sector has implemented strong mandatory vaccination policies. And it's important to note that the public sector has been the leaders of vaccination policies. Most of the public sector has chosen mandatory vaccination. So running through a couple of policy highlights here, all, all employees will have the choice to be fully vaccinated or undergo rapid testing. Again, this point speaks to our flexi flexible policy that considers vaccinated and unvaccinated employees. The city will cover the first three months of rapid testing for employees who are unvaccinated. It's a very reasonable approach considering we're taking on the cost of rapid testing. Policy has consideration for employees with medical religious exemptions, and the exemptions will be managed by our human resource team. Policy also has strong legal backing. As stated before, the policy has strong legal backing due to its reasonableness of considering rapid testing and vaccination. Our legal opinions have concluded that the city's policy does not violate any statutes being questioned. And finally, our resources for employees include employee family assistance programs. We understand that COVID-19 has created quite some personal challenges for our employees and we are, are providing employee family assistance programs um, to utilize the, the assistance in that, in that transition. So our HR team will also uh, be working closely with our employees through this process. All right, important dates. So as you can see from the timeline, we are giving employees two months to be fully vaccinated or choose to undergo rapid testing. Also very reasonable timelines for two months. This will give employees ample time to plan for this transition. November 15th, the policy will be shared with the organization. November 30th, the employees will have to submit proof of vaccination to employers if they choose, if they are already vaccinated and notification to employers seeking exemptions also opens at that time. Employees who choose to be vaccinated need to have the first dose by November 30th in order to be fully vaccinated by January 17th. December 30th is our next date and employees who choose to be vaccinated need to have their second dose by December 30th to be fully vaccinated by January 17th. And January 17th, um, that's two weeks after the December 30th date, um, employees will be fully vaccinated. All right, that's the end of my presentation. I did actually want to get a little bit into some of the questions. Um, just, just speaking to um, our legal opinions, direct quotes, for some of the things that are questioned. So as far as the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act Bill SO21, um, our, our legal opinion, in our opinion, the act does not apply and your policy does not breach the act. As further reassurance, the federal government and pretty much every provincial government has rolled out similar policies on this, not to mention the federal government 
Many rules required testing, including PCR testing for return to Canada, et cetera. As far as the human rights violation, the Alberta Human Rights Commission has posted in writing on their website that personal choice on vaccination and vaccination status is not a protected ground. As far as charter rights go, the charter rights and freedoms does not create any additional accountability um, or action rights for the employees against their employer. In these circumstances, this is not a mandatory vaccination policy, but rather, rather a policy that offers flexibility and options to employees to make their own decisions about their health care. As far as privacy goes, our legal opinion said privacy rights are not absolute. Employers have legitimate interest in determining whether the employers are or employees are vaccinated. At minimum, information about whether a worker is vaccinated and proof of vaccination might be needed to implement or develop a reasonable vaccination policies. These are legitimate reasons for employers to require disclosure and collect vaccination records. As far as civil liabilities, as the, as the city is following the guidance and recommendations of government and health officials, it is very unlikely it could be established that the city's policy is unreasonable and therefore successful private civil action is unlikely. As far as natural immunity goes. So natural immunity is being studied by um, our Alberta Health Services and I am not a medical doctor here. What I'm doing is um, seeking the information from Alberta Health Services, and they have had a meeting with the past council as well in this respect. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. So natural immunity is being studied by Alberta Health Services and so far have not communicated the effects of natural immunity. We may adjust our policy if we need to, but currently there is no news in that direction. direction. Vaccinations don't stop the spread of disease. However, occupational health and safety has identified COVID-19 as an occupational hazard, and they have identified vaccination as their control metrics. On September 21st, 2021, Alberta Health Services um, was here for a council meeting and they had mentioned how how long of an immune response, uh, the, one of the questions is how long an immune response an employee or an individual will have on the the COVID uh, virus as well as um, the, the, various, the various um, variants for COVID as well was, was present as well. So how long does the immune response last? How and how protective it, is it against the different variants? Extremely challenging to study. Um, and the body of science is under consideration and continues to be looked at. At this time, the best weapon against COVID remains vaccinations. According to Alberta Health, available evidence suggests that most individuals would have a certain degree of immunity at least 90 days after the initial diagnosis of COVID-19. However, the risk of infection is likely to increase after initial infection and exposures to variants that cause immune escapes. Vaccines help your immune system get ready to protect against the disease without actually getting sick. You may become naturally immune after being exposed to disease. However, risks of severe complications or even death are much greater than the risks of severe reactions after getting a vaccine. All right, and that's the end of my presentation, and I look forward to hearing questions. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. D'Souza. I have a bit of a queue building up, so I will start with Councillor Blackmore. I have, I have three questions for you, Mr. D'Souza. I just want to confirm, if we implement your policy, no one will be faced with rapid testing until January 17th, even if they tell you they're not going to get vaccinated. Mr. D'Souza? That is correct, yes, to the chair. Um, one of my other questions is, um, to figure out how to state this. Um, so if, if people choose to be vaccinated and uh, 
and not be rapid tested, but feel that they're coming down with a cold or a sniffle, come to you and ask for a rapid test to confirm whether or not they are um, safe to be in the workplace. Is that a possibility? Go ahead, Susan. Through the chair, it is a possibility. I think what we would need to assess is how many COVID tests we have in relation to um, how many people that would be tested. But yes, I, I do think that would be a possibility. And we are all hopeful that this is a blip in the healthcare uh, lifespan of all of us and that it will uh, eventually no longer be a necessary policy. And then at some time later beyond that, it might again become necessary. Is there a implementation um, phase or some way of determining inside the policy when it would fade out of existence and possibly come back into existence? the chair yes absolutely we have language in the policy that allows us to change any elements of the policy um, with our administration and with the recommendations that are coming out um, from our province our government and our, our health care service as services yes we absolutely okay. have that ability and i have one last thing um are we implementing this for uh only city staff or for people who work in city buildings? And I ask that question because I've been asked by some nonprofits working in city buildings who would be more comfortable if the direction came from City Hall. Mr. D'Souza? Through the chair, we are only including um, employees right now in our policy. However, we do have the flexibility to include for example, contractors in our policy if we choose to do so. Um, right now, we're really focused on, us and our, on our employees. Thanks, Councillor Blackmore. Blackmore. Uh, I'm moving to Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Uh, thanks for the presentation, uh, Mr. D'Souza. Um, so uh, I've got a litany of questions for you, but I'm only gonna start with three right now and largely in the realm of your expertise. Uh, for the first three questions. So earlier in your presentation, you said that uh, over this past year, we had many staff absences due to COVID-19. My question for you is, how many staff absences did we have due to COVID-19? Mr. D'Souza? Through the chair, um, I would prefer if those, if that information is told, it would be in camera. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'd, I'm just going to clarify the question because I'm not asking for specifics on any one member of staff, just a general number so I can get my head wrapped around the need for this policy. And I don't think an arbitrary number that doesn't reflect any staff at all uh, needs to go on camera. So uh, in regards to the question, I'll ask you again, how many staff absences did we have in the last year due to COVID? Through the chair, this is a public forum um, and my preference would be to go in camera around that information. You, you heard Ian speak about that as well. We have to be very careful in this policy and we have to make sure we protect um, all information. So my preference is to go in camera. Yeah, I'll move to go on camera. Sure, that motion's in order. Uh, let's vote to go in camera, please. Sorry. <laughs> so I guess uh, my next question. Just, would... just give us a sec. Let's deal with the motion on yeah. the floor, okay? Yeah, for sure. Thanks. And for those who are watching, we're going in camera, as suggested by the HR mamra, uh, manager, due to the fact that it's a, a, a question regarding staff. And, oh. All right, please vote. To shut, shut stuff down. down. Uh, just give it a second. Maybe touch. Um, sometimes, if you touch the item like 3.1 where it says COVID vaccine, if you touch that item again, it'll refresh and then the voting may show up. If not, you can verbally tell us how you vote. I'm going to split you two up. Michael, uh, Councillor O'Connor votes in favor. Thank you for that. Sorry, and CAO Galante has one comment before we shut down. Oh, in camera. Apologies. 
All right, you, uh, Ms. Karbyshewski, you want to tell us when we're clear?
Okay. Pizza, you had a question. Uh, you're still in the queue, so. For sure. Thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll just ask that question again. Uh, of our 850 plus staff, uh, how many over the last two years tested positive for COVID? Yours? Is my mic on? It is now, yep. Uh, through the chair, from the last two years, um, ending in June, we've had 36 employees who have been COVID positive and 49 close contacts. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now just a second question, and then I have one more after this. Of those, of those 36 uh, people who tested positive for COVID, did any of them die? Mr. D'Souza? Through the chair, no, they did not. Okay, thank you. And my final question, um, now I know that we discussed, you mentioned earlier, occupational health and safety, Alberta Health Services, Alberta Health, the government of Alberta, and legal. Besides legal, did any of those other organizations offer up um, protection for staff or workers who might get in, uh, injured by the vaccine? The reason why I ask this question is most recently the Canadian government uh, just released in September their vaccine injury support program. No details, but it's out there for anyone who's injured from the COVID-19 vaccine. It's the first of its kind in Canada, which is kind of incredible because they're copying Quebec's 1987 one. But I haven't been able to find anything in Alberta that provides Albertans protections from these vaccines. Now, I know our province is spending lots of money on advertising people to get vaccinated. Um, but are there any programs that are available to Albertans, specifically Grand Prairians, um, that provide protection to vaccine injury and compensation from that? And have we received those assurances from Occupational Health and Safety, Alberta Health Services, Alberta Health, or the Government of Alberta? Mr. D'Souza. Through the Chair, I am not aware of any, um, any of those things in our province. And Alberta Health Services and Occupational Health, uh, Health and Safety has declared vaccinations safe and we are giving employees the choice to of rapid testing or to vaccinate. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, next I have Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, Mr. D'Souza, you've actually pretty much answered my question, but I want to ask it in a very specific way. And I'll qualify first that I trust our medical professions professionals, and I do believe in vaccines. Now, you mentioned flexibility around this policy, and many of our delegates today brought up natural immunity. Now, I am no doctor, and none of them qualified themselves as a doctor either. So the question is, should federal or provincial chief medical officers of health recognize that through time, natural immunity is in fact adequate? Is this policy fluid enough to adapt as we work our way through COVID? Mr. D'Souza. Through the chair, it is um, flexible enough to adapt to, to all our situations. Um, in respect to the question of natural immunity, I'm I'm not a health professional on that topic. That's that's a, why I qualify chief medical officer. Yes, yes. Um, it's it's up to our governing bodies to decide that. And and right now, the research is there's there's a lot of controls uh, and questions that they still need answered before I think that could be. Um, demonstrated as fact. Yeah, thank you. Again, it is very fluid and very complex. And CAO Galante had an addition to that. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, just in addition to that comment, um, is one of the items we are uh, considering as well as one of the options of vaccinations, rapid testing, or potentially in the future as science evolves and, and the cost becomes more affordable as well to accept um, uh, antibody testing? which um, today still is, is very expensive. You need to go to a lab and, and go through a procedure, but potentially could be developing some sort of a rapid antibody testing as well. Um, uh, so could, could be the policy could be amended. Uh, it's flexible enough to, to accept that form of, of, of uh, you know, proof of uh, immunity uh, naturally because of acquired the, the virus itself and going through the process. Um, or via vaccines, because the immunity as well is, is over time, of course, waning. Um, but we're, 
we're analyzing that in, a, in, the, in the background for now for a potential adjustment in the future. Thanks. Thank you for that. Council Burke, you're good. All right, moving along, Councillor Bosch. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. D'Souza, for your information. Um, I have just, uh, I think, three. So we all previously, as a council, went to an information session with you and uh, the CLT and had discussions on this policy. Now, if I remember correctly, and maybe my counterparts here can um, attest to it, I thought that council had uh, indicated clearly by, by all of council that the approval of this policy should be a council decision versus an administration decision due to the nature of it being so uh, controversial and political. Now, is there a way that we can um, ask, maybe by show of hands, if I'm remembering this correctly? Um, oh, CAO Galante. I can clarify that. Uh, thank you, Mayor Clayton. So we have a couple of choices or options today with, with this, um, this policy. If council wishes to, to make it a, a council approved policy, you can, you can make the motion to do that. The motion as stated is, is the council committee for the whole received this policy uh, for information as presented that will give administration the authority to um, start implementing that. And we have a detailed procedure attached. However, the way it's written right now, this policy does not apply to council members, to elected officials. That's something you, you may consider as well. So if the wish of council is to transform this um, into a council policy applicable to elected officials. Um, there are two paths, and I'm looking at our city clerk as well to help me with, with the protocol. Uh, similar to, um, and I have a sample here, similar to our acceptable use of city and priority technology resources, we can incorporate uh, certain wording in the existing uh, policy to make it applicable uh, to elected officials. That could be probably the easiest option today that you will have to vote on that. Um, the other option is to just transform this into a template, kind of a council policy template, it's a little bit more complicated. So I would suggest that if the desire of council is to make it council policy applicable to council, we just use the existing template of the policy, with some, you, you, you direct administration to uh, implement those changes and we will incorporate just a paragraph. Uh, that's the simplest way. Uh, and that will be fully um, applicable to elected officials as well, as city staff. Okay, uh, maybe I'm just going to add to my second question, which is in part with this one, and the reasoning behind it. So not only for this policy, but for future changes in these policies, I think that when we spoke at this information session, uh, council was very um, apt to be a part of the discussions, if not uh, approval. And I guess this follows with, um, in a way, a trust factor for our public and our, for our staff. Um, an analogy would be the authentication process that you know all banking systems have or email systems have, that there is a second step um, to these policies and to these changes so that it isn't just um, ram through, for lack of better words, without there being a second step. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the next question I had is, in this information session that we attended, we were told there was about 1,600 rapid tests in stock, is that right? Okay, so that was um, supplied through a grant through the federal COVID response dollars, correct? So you are attaching $40,000 to testing. If you've already see received these through a grant, um, what is the $40,000 for? So 
or uh, Mr. D'Souza, before you answer that, just a reminder, um, if you're asked a question, just answer yes or no in your microphone because there are people watching and they don't always see people. So the question was asked if uh, 1,600, I think it is? 1,600, 1600 rapid tests. tests um, in stock. If they're already in stock, who paid for them? And thank you, Mr. D'Souza. Absolutely, through the chair. So that decision happened after um, Council had recommended that three months of uh, rapid testing were paid through by the employer. 1,600 would not cover off the amount of predicted employees that we would have. And we don't know that number right now. What we did is um, we found a provider that had daily rates in order to do that because there's also reporting pieces attached to the rapid testing. We don't want employees just doing their rapid testing by themselves, right? So we, we're actually entertaining some providers that would um, that would do that. Our, we, we were notified that there is an extension to these rapid testing pieces as well. So it could very well come under that mark, but we wanted to, to leave a little bit of a buffer just in case that didn't get extended. But it is our cheapest option that we found. A lot of um, a lot of providers are not allowing rapid te for you to use your rapid testing. You have to purchase the rapid testing yourself. So there were only two providers that we found that would do that. And this provider gives us the best estimate of what it is because they have daily rates opposed to employees. If it is employees, one of my fears is that, um, you know, because we're also paying for the test, that the numbers might be a lot higher than um, it would normally be. So we're just planning for that. Okay, thank you. So you said um, in your documents here that 77% of the city staff are fully vaccinated. Yeah, 77 or 78 type of Somewhere in there. So roughly 23%, um, and that can be split up potentially into, I haven't done it yet, I wish not to, medical conditions and such. What does that equate to our numbers in staff? Mr. D'Souza? Yeah, and that is so hard to predict because we don't know how many employees are going to do rapid testing, right? But however, we know what the daily rates are for it. What we're proposing is four days for testing um, where employees would go to this provider every, four, um, every 72 hours, but we have four day increments throughout the week. And that's how um, that's how we came up with those estimates. The sixteen hundred, again, it all it all matters with how many employees are, are mm -hmm. going to take the testing. But for example, if we did, if there were seventy five um, employees, we estimated that that would run out in two months. Okay, and also uh, for new employees, you have it listed that um, anybody that is a new hire ha must be vaccinated. Um, and there will be no other option for them? Yes, um, through the chair, sorry. Yes, we, we do have the option for, uh, for people to take rapid testing if, if administration does deem that fit. However, yes, uh, currently any new employees that come in after, after the implementation of the policy will have to prove that they're vaccinated, correct? So there is no rapid testing for potential new employees? No, no, through the chair, no. Okay, thank you for answering my questions. Just a clarification, I'm going to interject myself quickly um, on that last comment. Is that following the, the mid-January date or as soon as this policy is implemented? Through the chair, November 15th. Okay, thank you. All right, next in the queue, I have Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Jackie. Um, my, I want to compliment uh, your department on taking this very uh, proactive approach and looking after our employees. I think that's critical and making sure they have a choice. So I think that's very commendable. Um, is there any evidence that was brought up by uh, Ms. Reagan Dirksen uh, that there was uh, some evidence that the uh, the testing uh, has an alcohol that could be dangerous. Is there any evidence to pr prove that? Mr. D'Souza? Through the chair, not from anything that I found. Okay. My second question is, uh, and uh, 
the natural immunity thing I think you've already handled. Is there any thoughts to, uh, and it was brought up a couple of times, is there any thoughts to rapid testing employees who currently are vaccinated uh, and whether you do this randomly just to check up and see where they're at because that seemed to be a concern by a number of people. Mr. D'Souza. To the chair, um, great question. So when we when we thought about this, the the beauty of our policy is that it's reasonable. That is that is our strength in our policy. We have not seen any other municipality um, asking for um, employees to be rapid testing when they're vaccinated. So in our opinion, it would be unreasonable to ask an employee that is vaccinated to also be rapid test, and it would it would. Uh, it would tarnish the, the foundation of our policy. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, just, a just a little bit of a, que a couple questions about the nuts and bolts of this. Why the decision for every 72 hours instead of every 48 or 96 or? Mr. D'Souza. Through the chair, it was a common practice that 72 hours um, throughout municipalities uh, was used and um, I also believe that uh, it was it's been the recommendation for 72 hours for rapid testing I believe through um, Alberta through our province great thank you and in terms of where employees have to go get tested would this be happening at city work sites private medical offices just what are the nuts bolts of what they have to do to get tested through the chair great question um, we have a provider we're, we're working with providers on um, having employees go to the providers directly uh, through that and their hours would um, would operate o over their working hours as well. So we have weekends, we have weekdays up to 7 p.m. We have our time slots covered. And what efforts are being made for employees that don't drive or don't own a car, they're not able to drive, just what kind of efforts are being made to make sure that if somebody potentially has to go three times per week, I am worried about the impact on employees that don't have access to a personal vehicle. So how are they being considered? Through the chair, um, I don't think we have considered that, but just thinking about it, it's a great question. Um, we have kits, right? We could provide, we, ha we have a team that could could administer those pieces um, at their working units if if that it was deemed appropriate. What we're doing is we will deal with every situation um, independently, right? If there are situations that we have to work with an employee, um, we will explore those options. Okay, thank you. I also have a, something from CAO Galante to add. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, yeah, in addition to that comment from Sheldon, um, we are analyzing um, what would be the best way to minimize disruption in terms of travel time. Um, for example, fire department, they are currently doing on-site testing. So for example, they, they can potentially continue doing that instead of having to travel to a, um, to a, to a different venue. But if, if we implement this, and this is January 17th, um, we will probably establish several locations around the city so employees can minimize travel time. So in, it's in the works. We, are, we need to refine those, those options right now. So I'm just going to jump in on that note, um, Mr. D'Souza. So the $40,000 is indicated in the report is for the um, administration, of the administering of the um, of the testing. Um, you based that calculation on how many locations and how many hours a day? Through the chair. So we base that on four days a week um, on a daily rate. So we have daily rates associated with that. And we base that um, at the time that we did do that, we didn't know that there was going to be an extension to the through the um, test, the rapid test, we do now that, and we do know now that there is an extension to the rapid test. So, so honestly, the it should come up lower to that. What we calculated is after the sixteen hundred plus the administration of the um, of the test that um, we would still have a little bit, a month or so, to to cover off. So, um, yeah, that's how we that's how we kind of calculated those. And uh, just to follow up on that same topic, um, and you can defer to uh, Director Trim if you'd like, but what's the suggested funding source for that $40,000? Yes, um, through the chair, it is actually 
uh, listed in that report that we have, and it's through, um, I forget the funding, COVID okay. contingency. So I knew the answer. I guess what I'm looking for is that uh, explanation to council that this fund is COVID recovery money that isn't an implication, uh, doesn't impact tax dollars. So thanks. Uh, Councillor Bressley, you're done. So Councillor Thiessen, please. Well, I thought we were going to get around before we got back around, but uh, here we go. Sheldon, I'm going to skip you for a second. Um, in the report, it's, it mentions uh, right near the top um, that occupational health and safety identified COVID-19 as a workplace hazard and have recommended vaccinations as engineering controls to protect against COVID-19 virus. Now, um, I, for me, I find the terminology of engineering controls a bit dehumanizing. Like uh, when we're talking about vaccines, like we're not talking about Artie the snow clearing robot uh, who had to go away because his engineering controls didn't work. Uh, but we're, we're actually talking about engineering controls inside another human being's body. Um, uh, Mr. CEO, is there a more sensitive way to put this or is that just the way it goes? Okay. CEO it is um, typical jargon on occupational health and safety. When we talk PPEs and engineering controls or administrative controls, we have a hierarchy of controls. Uh, so, um, yeah, is is the is the just the technical word in uh, use on occupational health and safety? Okay, so just a follow up question to that: uh, with our snow grader operators, uh, what other type of engineering controls do we undertake on them currently so that they can do their job? much like the COVID-19 vaccine. It's just a random question. But Sorry, not, not, can you repeat the question? For sure. Um, where have we, here, I'll repeat, I'll, I'll change it up. Where have we instituted engineering controls in another human's body, the city of Grand Prairie? Well, we have engineering controls in, in multiple aspects. In their body. Um, I, I don't think in the body, I'm looking at Christy, but um, this is a pandemic situation, yeah. not a snow removal situation. So applicable to a pandemic situation is an engineering control applied to a human body. When we talk about snow removal, we apply engineering controls to machines or to ventilation systems in buildings. But because it's a pandemic and we're dealing with humans and biological viruses, then it's, it's appropriate to do engineering controls for those type of there is a there is a reason I asked that, but it's only just to place the moral question inside everybody's head here today. So the answer that our city manager gave us is we don't currently undertake any engineering controls inside our staff's bodies whatsoever. Was the answer. Um, so this would be a first for the city of Grand Prairie. Oh, sir Bressy. Thank you. I just fear that our right now my understanding is what we're supposed to be doing right now is a chance for council to ask questions and I fear that our colleague might be entering into a debate that would be more appropriate for council to have among itself when we've had a chance to ask questions. Sure. I'm not comfortable with it feels like we're debating administration right now which I don't think is appropriate so that's why I sure. felt the need to call a point of order. Councillor Thiessen if we could keep it to questions for now there will be an opportunity for d debate in discussion. For, for sure thank you very much Mayor Clayton and I, I don't mind uh, I don't mind being out of order at some points. Um, my, my next question research on these vaccines and on the vaccine mandates policies what other governments are doing and stuff um, where where have you found that the vaccines are regulated uh, in Canada like where where can we find spike vax comertony BioNTech Pfizer uh, where they're regulated and how they're regulated in the country of Canada Mr. D'Souza Could you rephrase the question? For sure. When you go to the Government of Canada website and you click on Moderna the vaccine or you click on BioNTech, Pfizer vaccine, Comertony or Spikevax, um, it'll give you a direct link to where they are regulated and, and legislated in law. Uh, and that would say, show you kind of how they're used, who watches over them, under what speculations or stipulations that we're, we're looking at, where in Canada are we regulating this in law, these vaccines? Through the chair, what we did was we seeked a legal opinion 
and, and health professionals and the, and the government on the creation of our policy. And those are the things that we looked at. We trusted that our occupational health and safety, our governing body, um, our top governing body, gave us um, the right advice and recommendations moving forward. So we looked at anything to do with the policy of infringing, of um, if discriminating against an employee, and all our legal opinions found that it hadn't. Okay, well, we'll get to Sorry, that in Councilor a little Kaysen, bit. I'm just gonna move on because there, as is, uh, Councillor Lanners, did you pull out? Or did you have a question? Um, well, I, I guess my. I guess my question is just because I'm a newbie here, I'm just trying to figure out. So when we're done asking questions of Mr. D'Souza, so um, the process will be then that we will we will internally debate this and then uh, well, there will uh, be make an a motion. For a motion, which there is a uh, suggested motion in the package, which is to receive this uh, item for information, or there is also an opportunity for okay. any other motions okay. that may be in order. Mayor Clayton, may I? Uh, there, is, there is a point to my question. Um, sure. So uh, the reason why I asked you that question, Mr. D'Souza, is in conversation with the lawyers, the doctors, Alberta Health Services, at least one person should have told you that all the, all the vaccines or drugs for COVID-19 are all regulated under the Canadian Food Drug Regulations of Canada. You can easily find that. It's a quick link right off of any of the vaccine pages. And the reason why I asked you that is because it says specifically in the Canadian Food and Drug Regulations uh, under Section 8, 9, and 10, that the COVID-19 vaccines are currently still under uh, emergency use authorization within there. And it also states as a COVID-19 drug that it is an innovative drug. And for the purpose of, of law, uh, an innovative drug is not considered to be approved by an ISAD interim order by the minister. So technically what we're talking about here today is mandating a policy or creating a policy mandate on a vaccine that isn't even under the vaccines that are regulated in the Canadian Food and Drug Point Act. of order, Mayor Clayton, this is debate. This is not a question. Um, Mr. Thiessen, could you get to your question, please? For sure. Um, what is administration's position on mandating an innovative drug that is not uh, approved fully by Health Canada? Through the chair? we are not mandating vaccinations. We're giving employees the choice whether to do rapid testing or whether to do vaccinations. Okay. So uh, I don't see anyone else in the queue. Uh, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. Just one last question I had was, uh, in the my understanding is it's administration intent to uh, have the city pay for rapid tests for the first three months. And what's the intent at the end of that three months? Is it, uh, ask employees to pay, to reevaluate then, and maybe we pay just what's the intent at the end of three months? Mr. D'Souza? Through the chair, great question. We will revisit that piece and let employees know what we're doing before those three months um, factor in. We just need to look at numbers and discuss that with, uh, with administration, obviously, before we make those decisions, but we're leaving that open for sure. Excellent, thank you. Can I interject a question here, and then I'll go back to you, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, Mr. D'Souza, can you tell me, uh, so the public is aware, what uh, the intent is in regards to uh, retracting this policy? And and so, when if the province says the federal, the uh, provincial governments aren't mandated, employees aren't mandated, what's sort of the triggers to for this policy to go away? Through the chair, great question. Um, we will take all information uh, from our government moving forward from our health from our health services as well and determine what we want to do uh, moving forward but something along the lines of them saying hey you know you, you don't need to get vaccinations or rapid testing or strongly strongly recommending we do that or we don't do that is when we would look at it and and change our pieces but it, it's it's a complex question um, because we don't know what's coming in the future. Uh, so I guess my follow-up to that is, in my opinion, the healthcare professionals will continually suggest that we get vaccinations, boosters, et cetera. So if the sentiment from the healthcare professionals is, is that it's recommended to get vaccination, you will still keep the policy in place. So do you see an end there? Through the chair. Um, it really depends what boosters look like, 
right? If if boosters are something that is recommended in the future, then that's that's what we'll have to look at. It it really depends on what the environment is looking, um, and us doing our research around that and gathering all that information before making that decision. It's it's just really hard to answer that question without going through those motions. So, and just a question then in regards to the process, I guess it's possibly for CAO Galante, as this is an administration policy, there's no opportunity for um, council to input uh, a finite time frame on this policy. Or is there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the intent of today's here is to, is to you know, seek feedback and, and any direction you want to provide to administration, we can we can tweak the policy, we can change it, we can amend it. So no problem. Just uh, direct administration to okay. you know <laughs> exercise uh, different options, okay. and we will okay. we'll do it. Uh, Councillor Thiessen, and sorry, I'm going to go to Councillor O'Toole because he hasn't had a turn yet. So today we're going to recommend this go to council in the. Where we're going to make the motion today. Currently, the motion as recommended, but feel free to make other motions no, that are in order, no, no. is to receive it for information as it would be an administration policy. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Clayton. Um, I guess my last question is, in, is to Mr. D'Souza or even perhaps our CAO, Mr. Galante, in regards to Bill S-201 that was referenced earlier. Um, now, I see all the relevant statutes that are listed. Some that are missing one and that's really pertinent to S-201 is the Canadian Human Rights Act, which uh, I'll just quote because I wrote it down here. But uh, is the grounds, if the grounds of refusal to undergo a genetic test, discrimination will be considered on the grounds of genetic characteristics. And according to the Human Rights Commission uh, and Tribunal, uh, the recommendation was to not clearly define it because definition can limit the interpretation and evolution of the ground. So my question to Mr. CAO or Mr. D'Souza is, um, by implementing this policy of choice um, to vaccinate or to get tested, we could very clearly on the second part be going against a federal law um, that was given royal assent and is also was amended into the Canadian Labour Code and the Canadian Human Rights Act. Um, under genetic characteristics. As the definition is, if somebody chooses not to get a test and, and then they are dismissed, they can come back against the employer. Um, to either of you, um, are you comfortable with this level of risk that we might be putting uh, the city of Grand Prairie organization under? Mr. D'Souza. Through the chair. <clears throat> Our legal team did determine <clears throat> That, that there's no human rights um, challenges with this. Sorry, my voice is <laughs> getting a little harsh. I'm talking too much. Yeah, and I saw that. I saw that in the report, and um, is actually in the legal portion of that. And I appreciate that. But what it also says is that it, there's no viral or genetic material inside, or that is detected by a PCR test. But I would encourage council and administration to go back to the January 25th, 2021 meeting with Alberta Health Services here, city council meeting, when Councillor Kevin O'Toole asked Dr. Koliaska if those PCR tests are accurate. And I actually have it here. I could play it, but I'm not going to belabor the time. Let's do a question, on please, five, on five, um, On five different occasions, she mentioned genetic viral material as what the PCR test picks up. So I just want to make that clear to council as we deliberate this. Thank you for that. Any further questions? Uh, Councillor Bosch. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, this is just a question in relation to what you just said. The rapid test and the PCR tests, are they based, Are they not different? So if you're talking about PCR tests and we're talking about rapid tests, I'd just like to know what exactly are we talking about here? Because I know PCR tests are well over $100 a piece. Mr. D'Souza, can you clarify what tests we will be offering? Through the chair, <clears throat> I am... Um, the provider that we that we have chosen will uh, um, administer the tests, and the tests are ones that we deemed um, fit. I would ask 
Um, maybe um, Christy could answer some, some more of those questions. Ms. Lee. Thank you through the chair. We are administering a rapid antigen test. Through the chair, yes, that's a different test than a PCR. Further questions for administration before we go into potential deliberation and debate on a motion? <coughs> Councillor Thiessen, this is a question, and it'll be a question. Probably mix in with the statement, but likely, yes, it'll just be a question. Uh, my question is uh, also in regards to the report that was sent out. Uh, it said that there was many studies that were done throughout Alberta, Canada, North America, Europe, and the world. Um, so my question to administration is, what type of uh, research at time did we put into looking into um, how others had dealt with COVID differently, such as the states of Florida, Texas, Sweden, and Israel? Mr. D'Souza? Through the chair, um, I actually read an article yesterday about <laughs> Israel that uh, <clears throat> mentioned that they're doing a lot better because of the introduction of booster shots and, and other vaccinations. So the, <clears throat> things were considered in that realm, but uh, we, we compare well with our comparators. We look at our comparators. We look at our governing bodies for directions. We look at their, our top professionals to give us advice, and that was a, the advice that we, choose, we chose to take. Thank you. Any further questions for administration? Seeing none, thank you for your time, Mr. D'Souza. Uh, I will now be looking for business arising. Uh, Mayor Clayton, if I may just request a, a five minute uh, Absolutely. break. Absolutely. We've been meeting for over two hours, so if we can have a five minute recess, and please keep it to five minutes as we're getting long in the day.
thank you for your patience as we took a brief recess there. Council has literally been in meetings since uh, 9 a.m. this morning. So um, I'm now uh, looking for business arising, and I recognize Councillor O'Toole in the queue. Thank you very much, Mayor Flaky. I move the Council Committee of the Whole um, recommend that the COVID-19 vaccination and rapid testing policy uh, be, uh, in, uh, be a policy. I also want to add the fact that uh, direct administration to incorporate council members as part of the COVID-19 vaccination and rapid testing policy as well. Will that work? Um, it, in my opinion, it's, um, I think that it should be, be separated. I'll look to legislative services though to see your thoughts. Tell me how to wordsmith this. Testing. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. And um, for the proposed motion uh, to uh, uh, incorporate an amendment and an approval would be out of order. Okay. I would suggest uh, begin with the amendment and then council can um, approve accordingly thereafter. Okay, then we'll do that. I'll say it again. I'd like to direct administration to incorporate council members as part of the COVID-19 vaccination rapid testing policy. All right, that motion is order. Looking for discussion uh, or debate. I recognize Councillor Leoners. Okay. Uh, so, because I have a few people in the queue, if you're speaking to the amendment, please raise your hand and then I will. Councillor Blackmore and then Councillor Bressy. Um, I would support this amendment because I believe that if any policy uh, that is applicable to staff should also be applicable to people who are sitting around this table, um, sort of putting our money where our mouth is. Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you, Mayor Clayton. I certainly support the intent of this motion in that I think if something's applicable to staff, it sh we should be living by it as well. That being said, I think what's tough about this is we don't have the power to fire other council members under the Municipal Government Act. And so we can't say, hey, to be employed by the city, receive a paycheck, be on council, you have to honor this policy. I think what we likely could do legally under the Municipal Government Act is put requirements on council members if they want to do in-person attendance or something like, some, if they want to be in a room with other employees, but we can't say, sorry, you're not on council anymore because you're not following this policy. The Municipal Government Act just doesn't give us that power. So certainly support the intent. I think the specifics of this might not be viable for us. I just want to recognize legislative services clerk or manager, apologies. That's okay. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, in response to uh, Councillor Bressy's um, inquiry, uh, th the motion is for uh, administration to amend the policy to add a clause that makes this policy applicable to Council. That would include language that we um, use in similar administrative policies where Council's included, and it provides the provisions to um, support our council code of conduct uh, as opposed to our human resources policies. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So in order to incorporate councils, um, a mandate that uh, council has to abide by within a administrative policy. We will also include language around how council uh, is mandated, um, which is through the council code of conduct. And we'll include provisions within the administrative policy that align with that, that information. So council, of course, can't be terminated, but council can be held to a, uh, the power of the council code of conduct bylaw. And that language will be with written within the, as directed. Okay. Further discussion or debate on the amendment to the policy? Can, 
Uh, sorry. Councillor O'Connor. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering then if we shouldn't direct us or council to bring this up on the code of conduct uh, and then bring that forward for further ratification. Is that the right procedure? Ms. Karbyshevsky. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. The Council Code of Conduct already provides provisions for Council to abide by. So incorporating language into an administrative policy to in, uh, enforce Council's requirements only needs to be um, created within the administrative policy. It would already direct you to the Code of Conduct provisions. Okay. Thank you. Let's just take a moment till you tell us we're ready to go. It stops working at five. Oh, 4.38. <laughs> City Hall closes at 4.30 and everything shuts down. Well, you said three hours, we're actually got three hours. Yeah, hours. probably. Press 1 now to continue this call in English. Para continuar en español, presione... Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID. Enter your participant ID. You are in the meeting now. There are five participants in the meeting. All right, I understand we're back. My apologies for that delay. Our audio stopped momentarily. And now I forget where I was because the queue cleared. Uh, I feel like there was somebody. No? Oh, Councillor Bosch, did you have something? Oh, okay. So there's no further discussion or debate on the amendment. I will look, uh, call the question. And that is carried eight to one. Looking for further, I'll go to you, Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So I just have some concerns in regards to the new employees starting after November 15th. Um, I do have some fears that uh, with already the struggling labor shortage that we have, are we now eliminating the potential of some great people uh, working for our city without giving them, um, you know, any kind of accommodations. Hopefully this is a short term um, issue that we have to deal with. Um, so I would like to make a motion that we leave in accommodations for new employees. All right. So be to direct administration to remove the the line in regards to new hires, which in turn would be to that new hires would 
be allowed the opportunity to rapid test as well. Okay. Thank you. Comments or questions on that motion? Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Um, I'm actually in support of that. I'm sure I surprised a few of you when I voted in support of me. Um, I know we're in a living in a time where it's your body, your choice, or something like that. But um, I'm fully in support of this because uh, I, I felt like the practice of um, hiring staff and only hiring them if they check the box of vaccination was a very discriminatory practice that was blatant uh, and went totally against the Canadian Human Rights Act. So. I'm in favor of this amendment. Thank you for your comments. Further comments, question, Councillor O'Connor. Yes, I agree. I'm I'm glad that Chris brought that up, so I'll be in support. Councillor Bressy. Thank you, Mary Clayton. Um, just a just a procedural question. Two procedural questions. One is, first of all, is this is unusual in that this is a administrative proce procedure and we don't usually get into administrative procedures so usually when we're discussing things it's a council adopted policy and has to go to city council meeting to to get approved uh so we can actually make decisions as a committee we could just recommend to council to make decisions so i guess my two questions are what happens to this is it still an administrative procedure where there's administrative flexibility changes needs arise once we start making amendments and also does do we get to give direction today and that's the final direction or is this would this be going back to council for approval and i didn't ask that last one because that was council giving direction about council so i th i think that maybe not technically different but it is very different council to talk about council i'm concerned procedurally now that we're getting into us giving direction about staff Ms. Karbyshevsky. thank you mayor clayton the it is an unusual practice this is not common for an administrative policy to come forward before council for endorsement. However, uh, this is an administrative policy that can and will be approved at the CAO level. Um, we are just providing uh, council with an opportunity to participate in um, something of a sensitive and um, uh, organizational um, wide impact uh, policy. So to, uh, by this committee directing administration to do something that is well within the control and the authority of this council, uh, it will still be the authority of the CAO to approve at the end of it. CAO Galante. Thank you, uh, Mayor Clayton. As uh, City Clerk stated, this is a very unusual um, topic we're dealing today, um, but I would absolutely um, uh, follow your your guidance and direction in terms of any amendments or adjustments to the policy, like in the one that is on the floor. Um, Hundred percent, I will then finally approve that at the administrative level, but incorporating council's uh, feedback and input uh, today. Thank you, Councillor Bressy. Right. And then I guess just procedurally, uh, is is the intent that this is when we're touching this policy right now, the intent is that we finish this and unless we give you directions, come back to us or it needs change, you choose to come back to us. It, we're not touching again. It's not coming to the next council meeting or anything like that, correct? I see some nods to that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see no one else in the queue on this amendment. Councilor Bressy? I'll actually argue, I'll argue against it too. I ask my clarifying questions and argue against it. It's for me, I really am, uh, if if I had the pencil and I was on our corporate leadership team and I was part of that team forming this policy, would I, what would I be arguing for? I honestly don't know. Uh, I think for me though, we really are talking about occupational health and safety and very nuts and bolts of our organization. And I really trust our managers to know what recruitment needs are and what the, and what's going to introduce bigger challenges having this policy in or not. And I'm just not comfortable with us really meddling in this policy substantially if we're not going to make it a council level level policy. So again, last amendment was different because I was council talking about council. I'm not comfortable supporting council, giving direction about staff. And so I think I'll be voting against this. 
further comments or questions? If not, uh, Ms. Bosch, I'll give you an opportunity to close on your amendment. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. I do understand what you're saying, Councillor Bressy. Um, however, this is just not something as simple as a typical, you know, parking bylaw. This is um, something that we are discussing that is highly, you know, polarized. It is about directly impacting people. And I do believe that um, whatever side you stand on, we have great people in the city of Grand Prairie and potential employees coming to the city of Grand Prairie. And I would hate to eliminate um, or put barriers up to people that could be a um, asset. So I hope that you uh, go with this uh, motion to amend. Thank you for your close, Councillor Bosch. I'll call the question. My e scribe timed out. Um, so, Tyson, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you for that. That carries five to four. Uh, Councillor Lerners. Yeah, I, I too would like to make an amendment. Turn my mic. There we go. Um, it, it, it seems when I look at the the legal opinion and AHS's OHS um, recommendations. One of the things, the last paragraph, the, the summation on her, her note is that at some point in the future is expected that these policies will no longer be needed and will be rescinded by Alberta employers. And then when you go to the OHS, they sim they talk about, um, you know, employers are to assess the active cases in a region to determine the risk management. I was nervous when Mayor Clayton was asking, oh, when do you think this will end? And the response was, well, because I think the answer will always be vaccinations are always a handy thing to have. So I'm not so I'm not as obsessed about the um, vaccination part, but there is a kind of a, I think I'd like to make an amendment pertaining to the continuation of the rapid testing. So when does that end? And so I would like to make a motion that uh, council direct administration to amend the policy so that rapid testing will no longer be required when the REP program is eliminated, eliminated and or the efficacy of natural immunity is recognized by Alberta Health Services. And yeah, that motion is in order. Comments or questions on that motion? Councillor Bressy. Oh, sorry, <laughs> forgetting what we're using. But I think this is actually a great example of why I'm so hesitant about council wading into a wading into an administrative policy. Is the ra the restriction exemption program and the wording of this motion is the restriction exemption program is exemption from public health orders. It's not public health orders themselves. So we could get into we could get into a fifth wave, and we could have. A way worse cases than we've ever had before, and the provincial government could, and the provincial government could go. Well, sorry, there's no more exemptions allowed, and all of a sudden, if I'm understanding this amendment correctly, we'd be saying, hey, at the very worst of COVID, when the provinces just introduce a whole bunch of restrictions, we're rescinding the, rescinding this policy, and so it's. I think the wording of that is problematic. When I assume, and maybe I'm misinterpreting the under the situation, but I assume that it, the intent of this was, hey, when the province pulls back restrictions, not when it pulls back exemptions from restrictions, we want to end this policy, which might be a good intent, but I don't know if that intent is what's actually captured in this motion. I'm really worried about us meddling in this administrative policy because I'm, I'm worried that we haven't considered all the consequences and the best way to do things like our administration has. Your comments, Councillor Tool. Thiessen. Sorry, Mr. Bessie, uh, you totally lost me in your in your ramble. Um, but uh, I'd like to support you, but on this one I can't because I I just don't know. I I mean I asked administration where is 
these vaccines regulated and we didn't know. I, I trust that they did their due diligence and work, but um, I, I think we need a body of oversight as well. And I think maybe you might be leaning into uh, what your preferences are rather than what the reality is. So I, I'm fully in favor of this. CAO Galante. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, perhaps for Council Leonard's uh, clarification, we have a weekly briefing. Um, the the, the mid-side cities in the province with Dr. Hinshaw. So, so about 20 municipalities, we're in the same boat on, on this situation right now. And we constantly uh, share information and um, enacting this kind of policies uh, in the last couple of months. So the question about when to adjust or even when to rescind the policy will welcome for sure, because we are constantly monitoring this. So perhaps if it will be of you know, your comfort that if we detect at some point in the future there is no longer a need for this, we will inform immediately council as well. But we are really depending on the advice of Dr. Hinshaw in this case, or Health Canada or the provincial health authorities monitoring this situation and if there's a need to rescind, you will know. Um, so I'm not sure if that gives you some comfort about your, your amendment, but uh, it's difficult for us now to, to attach this to a REP program. Just one second. Um, I'm gonna, I'll come back to you to close, Councillor Leonard's yeah. Councillor O'Toole. I think when we first started this whole process about a year, 18 months ago, uh, we had a concern about wearing a mask and the numbers and where we were. We didn't get an accurate number, or we didn't have a number that everybody agreed to, so we chose a number. That's how it come about. Uh, now we're sitting there and we're not, and we're wearing masks again. So we can implement it and withdraw it at any given time under the direction of administration, which gets their uh, information from the provincial governing body and the federal government. So uh, I'm pretty pretty satisfied that if administration was to monitor this and give us the heads up, we, whether we have a, an emergency meeting to take it down or bring it up, uh, whatever, I, I'm very confident that this will work the way it's such it, in the program here, so. Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Clayton. Um, I'm in agreement. I think that uh, we shouldn't support this amendment because we're starting to get into the weeds and uh, starting to instruct administration how to do their job. I think we have to trust administration and allow them to come back if they need our input. I think then we can come back in. So I will not be supporting this motion. Seeing no one further, Councillor Lerner's to close. Yeah, I, I, I just, I guess I'm not as confident that the, the, the risk threshold of administration is, is, is at the same level as ours, all right? So um, it's the, the easy answer is to just keep doing it forever and ever. And, uh, you know, there's always a little bit of a risk. and. And, you know, this is very arbitrary going into this process, and it'll be very arbitrary going out. Um, and so, and there's lots of, and there's lots of opportunities for, um, you know, there'll be lots of touch points and, and, and places where you can get on and off the elevator. And I, I just, I'm just nervous that this will, this will extend and extend and extend. And I just don't, I, and I've, I've been in the healthcare business you know, on the board, my wife's been on it forever. Their default is always, let's just be super cautious and super safe. And we will, we will drive that train forever and ever unless we, we, we direct our council or direct our, 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 our sorry, our administration to have some, some more definitive, definitive endpoints. And if they decide, if they come back and, you know, I'd rather have it the other way around, that we decide this and then our administration says, well, this is what's happened. We've, they're, res they're removing the restrictions, but gosh, we, you know, AHS still says it's unsafe. I would rather then have them come to us with that situation as opposed to, well, we'll just leave it up to you. And when you think it's safe, um, then that's up to you. And I, I don't know, I, I just don't want to go down that road. I want them to come to us 
as opposed to the other way around. So I think it's, um, you know, we've, we've made some, you, you could, I, I could easily be convinced to pick an arbitrary number like you did when you said at 100 cases per 100,000, we're going to make everybody wear masks in the city. That was <laughs> pull it out of the air science. And so we could, in, you know, introduce some more out of the air science if we want to. We could call it 20 cases or 30 cases. Whatever you want to do, I don't really care. But I just think there should be some kind of definitive number where they have to come back and convince us that we have to extend this program and not the other way around. And that's the that's the essence of what I'm talking about. And that is your close. Thank you, Councillor Lerners. I'll call the question. Sorry, my. That is defeated four to five. All right. Uh, any further motions or business arising? Councillor Bressy. My apologies, Mayor Clayton. I'm in the habit from the morning and <laughs> not using the queue system. Yes, too. So my sincere apologies for that. Uh, I would move that that commit that committee direct administration to check in with council on this policy by the end of quarter one. Because I really hear what Councillor Lenners was just saying. I think that this should be something that Council is on top of and not just letting run indefinitely without direction. I was worried about specific wording there. and But I don't think this should be something that Council just sets and forgets today. And so I think it is prudent on us to make sure that it's something that is a regular checkpoint of Council if it's going to be brought in. Sorry, I missed. Um, thank you, Councillor Bressy. CAO Bullard, did you want to uh, address that? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, I believe it's at the very end of the policy. There is a review clause um, that says that this policy and allowing procedures shall be reviewed and revised regularly, at least every six months, or as circumstances warrant, to ensure alignment with public health measures and regulations, and to confirm um, it adequately adequately covers the health and safety risk. So the six months checkpoint here on the policy, uh, if council directs us, we can uh, we can use this six month uh, checkpoint to bring it back in a public forum to uh, to council, not only at the administration level, and do a summary about what is new, what changed, if there is any adjustments needed, uh, depending how the pandemic evolves. So we can use this checkpoint as a as a, as a public um, public information session. So then a question, Councilor Bressy, your intent would be to amend that six months to, to have it come back, uh, in essence, the end of March after the first, end of first quarter? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Clayton. I think I'll stand by saying uh, NQ1, it doesn't necessarily need to amend the policy. We, just, we could bring the policy as is without review to us. And specifically, one of the reasons why, for me, I don't want to wait the six months is because, for me, it's a substantial question in our mind with, finan with not just employee management, but also with financial implications is, what to do with who pays for rapid testing after three months. And so for me, waiting three months past that three months is a bit longer than I'm comfort comfortable for. And so I appreciate the comments. I appreciate knowing what I'm getting into with this motion. So thank you for those comments. But I think I'll stick by my end of Q1 motion. Okay. So that motion is in order. Comments or questions on that, Councillor Thiessen? I think you're probably something else. Or are you, would you like to speak on this amendment? No, no, I actually wanted to speak on this amendment. Okay. Um, in fact, I thought that uh, it should be even sooner. I thought uh, if we're going to implement it in January, we should do a check-in in January and then do a check-in at the end of three months. And I think we should continuously check in. I mean, that's our responsibility. Um, if we're doing good governance and our due diligence and we truly care about the health and safety of our employees, we want to make sure that we're on top of everything as this situation is rapidly changing all the time. And that's one thing I've learned over the last 20 months is that Nothing is staying the same forever. Uh, we're constantly getting a new swerve, a new curve, a new lockdown, a new restriction. Um, so we should be on top of this too, and we shouldn't allow it to lapse. So um, I, I'm, I'm game with it, but I would go even sooner. I'd go to January. 
Thanks for your comments, Councilor Thiessen. I see no one else. I'll uh, chime in here quickly. Uh, I agree. The end of January is a reasonable check-in, in my opinion. Um, I think that uh, end of the court first quarter is also a good check-in. I feel that after two weeks of execution, I'd like to know how it's being administered, how it's going in, in the facilities that we're choosing as locations to administer it. And so, um, Fine. Let's. Uh, I would, if you would take a friendly amendment um, to add an additional date of the end of January as well as the end of quarter one. Um, but I'll look to Councilor Bressy. Yeah. Thank you. I. Um, I. I don't think I'd accept a friendly amendment, although I definitely think it would be appropriate for somebody to move an actual amendment. But the reason for that is kind of speaking to my intent to this motion is that the intent of this is that it comes back to us in an environment like this where we can have substantive debate and substantively talk about changing course what you want and for me it's not just a shove it into a director service upgrade update or a city manager's update about hey we just started this here's how it's going going by the way but actually have substantive conversation about that and I don't think we need to do that two weeks after implementation that being said my personal it's not reflecting emotions so it's just my personal you can take it how he wants but my hope would be that with something this big important public facing our city manager would be giving us those updates a couple weeks after and keeping us in the loop but the intent of this motion really is to trigger something like today, which I think is more appropriate when we're a couple months in, not a couple weeks in. So I sure, certainly wouldn't fight you procedurally if somebody wanted to move an actual amendment, but I don't think I'd accept a friendly amendment. Okay. So we can't amend an amendment, so I'll um, leave that because yours is an amendment. Uh, sorry. Ms. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. This is actually a main motion. These are My not apologies. amendments to uh, right. our main motion. So then I would look to see if anybody has an amendment to the motion. Uh, Councillor Lerners. I would um, amend that motion to direct uh, council to give a, a wholesome update and uh, and um, justification for well, justification would be hard just just a wholesome update and uh, recommendations regarding the success and moving forward uh, of plans for COVID at the end of January. Or you meant administration to give that update. Yes. Um, Did I say that? You no. said council. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to log in here real quickly. <laughs> um, I have to log back into my eScribe, but I'm just going to make sure that everybody has the uh, intent of the amendment. Um, and if there's any comments or questions on the amendment, I would take those now. Seeing none, I'll call the question on the amendment. Mayor Clayton votes in favor. Council Councillor Bressy votes opposed. Sorry. Did, okay, we're good. So that is carried eight to one. So back to the original motion as amended. Comments or question on the motion as amended? Councillor Thiessen. Could I, could I just get the motion read back? Is that just the main motion with all the amendments? Or? Ms. Karbyshewski, could you? No. It's, uh, go ahead, Ms. Karbyshewski. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, the main motion with the amended wording will be committee direct administration to check in with council on this policy at the end of January 2022 and by the end of Q1 of 2022 in a council committee of the whole meeting. Perfect. Yep, that's exactly what I wanted to know. Thank you. So comments or question on that motion? Seeing no one in the queue and no one moving too quickly, I will call the question. Please vote. Mayor Clayton votes in favor. And that is carried unanimously. Councillor Thiessen, are you still in the queue from, or is that new? Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Uh, this is uh, an amendment to the policy as well. Um, now, there's been lots of discussion about discrimination, inclusion uh, from our staff that has been here today and from uh, different members of council, myself included. So for this, for this being, I do not want to, I do not want to take our staff 
and uh, sort of separate them from based off of a vaccination status. So my motion is, is this, and then I'll speak to it. I would move that under this policy, the city undergoes random uh, rapid antigen testing of vaccinated employees on a weekly basis. Uh, and just to, just to speak to that, um, there's been lots of talk about breakthrough cases. I appreciate you, Gladys. Um, there's, been lots of, there's been lots of talk of breakthrough cases. Um, I spoke. To, I speak to it. I'm taking stats as we speak. A random control trial, citizen science, I believe, is what it's called. Just of the NHL superstars. Uh, currently, they're all 100% vaccinated, and they get tested on a weekly basis as well. And thus far, um, their rates of infection and testing positive for COVID are higher this year than they were last year by more than double. Uh, when I first mentioned this to council, it was 44 players of healthy 18 to 40 year old ages. Uh, now it's 61. So that rate just keeps going up. By the end of the season, we're probably going to be looking at three quarters of the league that'll have tested positive for COVID and had to enter into COVID protocols. So for the safety of all of our staff, I would, I would, I'm making this motion so that we can be sure that even the vaccinated people aren't being asymptomatic or aren't being symptomatic carriers uh, affecting other vaccinated employees or unvaccinated employees. Thank you. Uh, refer to Councillor to CAO Galante for a comment in regards to the measurable on that. Um, thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, I would appreciate if if um, we can attach a number of that because random could be 500 people per week or two people per month. So a little bit more specifics if we want to go that way, and there is cost associated with that as well, um, depending the number of the number of people um, vaccinated that could be tested. So more, a little more specific will help uh, define this. For sure, not to, not to be more than 100. And to speak to that, um, I'm fully leaving it in your capable hands, Mr. CAO, to determine the number within this policy that is appropriate based off of what we have in stock and what our budget is looking like. Um, I don't know the number of staff that are totally vaccinated. I can do the math. I guess 78 percent are fully vaccinated. We know that. Um, but as far as the rest, I'm not looking to vaccinate or to test all of our staff. Just to make sure that department by department, um, that we're making sure that we are not contributing to the spread of COVID-19 within the organization of the City of Grand Prairie. So I'll just check with Ms. Karbyshewski before I recognize Councilor Blackmore. Do you have the So under this policy, the city undergoes random antigen testing. Yeah, it's in there. Um, yep. So the motion as uh, corrected is under this policy, the city undergoes random antigen testing of not more than 100 vaccinated employees. CAO Galante? Is that per week? Per week. Okay, I just want to talk about budget impact on this. So, if we were, we have approximately 650 full-time, full-time equivalent employees. Okay, full-time equivalents. That that's not heads, but just full-time equivalents. The head count, because we have part-time employees, have seasonals could go up to you know 1,000 sometimes. So if we're gonna um, when I did the math for about 700 employees, which this is 100 per week, so it will be 400 per month. So bear with me with my calculation, okay? Because I did the math for 700, 700 employees, tested every 72 hours, and the number was $150,000 a month. So this could be half of that. So the impact of testing 100 employees every week we will be in the range of probably sixty to seventy thousand dollars. So just for council to consider this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that, Director Galante. And again, I'm not asking you to do a hundred tests a week. I said uh, up to a hundred tests per week. Uh, again, I'm relying on your expertise here. Um, for me, sixty to seventy thousand dollars a week is a small price to pay to save someone's life, especially working at the city of Grand Prairie. And we want to ensure that everybody is healthy. And no one is transmitting to the vaccinated or the unvaccinated, especially among the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. 
Councillor Blackmore. Not a lawyer, um, obviously, but I'm not sure that you can set up random testing. I think they use the word random. You're stepping into a uh, violation of rights. You can set up a schedule so that people know when they're going to be vaccinated or sorry, when they're going to be tested, but you can't just say, okay, George, we're doing you this week. You can't do that, I don't think. So I'm not going to support this motion. Councillor O'Toole. Yeah, I won't support it either. I think that if the employee is feeling sick, uh, like the policies that we got in here, you go home uh, or get and get tested. Uh, but uh, I'm not... I'm not in favor of this motion. Uh, and I think the numbers that you create, doesn't matter if it's 10 people e a week or 100, I, I still think that's uh, unneeded. I'll leave it at that. Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you, Mayor Clayton. It might be the long day getting to me, so my apologies that I have to ask this question, but Councillor Tisa, can you just I'm not quite getting what you think this will accomplish. Could you just tell me if the chair would permit, could I just have it one more time? What are you hoping to accomplish with this? Councilor Deason. Thank you, Councilor Bressy. I really appreciate that because I hate to wait to close to have to ram in everybody's answer to everybody's question or statement. Um, what I'm looking at of this is the health and safety of our organization and ensuring that that's happening. Uh, currently, um, we have a choice policy that is we have to still vote on. Uh, it's between mandatory vaccination or or optional testing. Those are your choices. Um, now, I want to make sure and ensure that we are on top of the spread of COVID-19. We do know there are breakthrough cases amongst the vaccinated. Uh, those are happening more and more every day. Uh, there's lots of stats around the world that are already there. If the purpose of this policy is to keep our staff healthy and safe, we cannot create a divide between vaccinated and unvaccinated. We should use every reasonable resource that we have at our disposal to ensure that COVID-19 is not getting into these walls. And if it is, then we're knowing about it. Now, as far as Councillor O'Toole said, hey, if somebody's sick, they can just go home but we're still testing unvaccinated employees whether they want to be tested or not. So if they're asymptomatic carriers, uh, because that's what we label people nowadays, then there could also be asymptomatic vaccination carriers as well that could get other people sick. And every life matters, to me at least. Um, and I hope that you guys can get behind this. The number to me doesn't matter. If we do five per department, if we have a roll call of people that come up for their random test, you know, uh, every staff, every employee member of, of the city of Grand Prairie is tested at some point. I think this is probably the best way to go word for word, letter for letter, for the purpose behind this policy, which is for the health and safety of our staff at the city of Grand Prairie. Thanks. Councillor uh, Bressy, you're good? But do you have what you need? Yeah, but if I could speak to it sure, now that I've absolutely. got clarity. Yeah, thank you. I just... Um, I just don't see how this accomplishes what's what the mover of this motion is hoping to accomplish in terms of, for me, it makes sense to say, hey, we're, tr we're trying to create a safer organization so employees who we know have a higher risk of, in, of infection, that we're putting protocols in for them. And those are consistent protocols that are ongoing with a, gr with a group that does have an identified higher risk of, of catching COVID. COVID than others. I don't know what a one-time test of a random person accomplishes other than it, it's, I can see the feel good of, hey, everybody's kind of in, in this together. I could see some of those morale payoffs maybe, but I don't see how a one-time random test of an employee who doesn't have any additional risk factors over the, jet, over the majority of the population accomplishes anything. And so for me, I can't support this motion. I don't think the I don't think the feel goods are worth the financial cost, and I don't see how this actually does further safety in a substantial way in the organization. Councillor O'Connor. I have, thank you, Mayor Clayton. I will not be supporting this motion as I think it's uh, putting an onerous uh, testing requirement on the organization if someone is ill 
get tested just to make sure, even if you're vaccinated. So um, I'd approach it that way and leave it up to administration. Thank you. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, I will not be supporting this motion and not because of um, necessarily the intent of what uh, Councillor Thiessen has said. I do agree that absolutely there is the breakthrough cases. Um, how many and how much? I think that is too early. Like we don't know those numbers in, in any concept yet. Um, at one point, Alberta Health Services was doing a ton of testing and and found out that it was not um, feasible to continue that, for instance, in the school systems. So not I'm not uh, supporting this on the basis of your intent, but on the basis of there's no metrics, there's no there's no qualifiers to to these numbers for me for the cost in addition to uh, the metrics. Thank you. Councillor Thiessen to close. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. I appreciate everybody's thoughtful consideration of my thoughtful motion. Um, I, I can see where the writing on the wall is here. I'm just going to address a couple things. Uh, I was spoken that if someone is ill, get tested. Shouldn't we be applying that to our unvaccinated staff if that's the case? Uh, we don't know uh, how, how healthy someone can be with or without a vaccination, but currently in Israel, 94% of people that are hospitalized are double vaxxed. And in Massachusetts, 74% of people who are double vaccinated are also hospitalized as far as that population goes. So, I mean, we can, we can be full of our own hubris here, but what I'm talking about is true lives and true safety for people uh, and a, a non-discriminatory practice that actually works to hopefully help mitigate the spread of COVID-19. If you can't see that, I can't convince you of anything else. Thanks. Thank you for that close. Karpaszewski, who are you missing? She's on. Okay. And that is defeated. Councillor Bosch. Okay. Anyone else? All right. So I'll be looking for a mover of the multiple amended amendments of the main motion. Councillor Blackmore. I would move that uh, this matter be referred back to administration with the attached amendments included for um, to bring back to council at a future date. Okay, perfect. That motion's in order. Comments or questions on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Sorry, Hold Ms. Karbyshewski. Sorry, I'm getting impatient. We got another meeting in 20 minutes. Who are you missing? Thank you. I voted, but so sorry. Just a just a point of order, Councillor Clayton. It's I'm just checking in with Councillor Blackmore if this meets the intent of her motion. It's not what I personally understood in it, and I I don't know if I could support this this motion in particular. Councillor Blackmore, the motion as uh, shown to us reads that committee direct administration to bring forward the amended policy for council's consideration. Um, Councillor Blackmore? I didn't hear that comment, but it, to me, it, it captures it. Unless we want to attach a date to it, that would be the... 
Councilor Pressley. Yeah, and I guess just checking in with intent, just um, this one of those things where we're a new council, we need to figure out what our new practices are. Under the past council, a motion like this would have meant it was coming to the next council meeting and we've been touching it again and the administration can go do work. So I just want to make sure that that's not... And I think that's council Blackmore's, Blackmore's intent. So yes. Yes. Oh, so yes. Yeah, I would accept that as a friendly amendment to bring it back to the next council meeting or... Gotcha. That I that I misunderstood your intent. I'm glad we clarified so that we could misunderstand your intent. And for me, I will be voting against this motion. Then I just don't see the work we need to do at the next council meeting to do this. I'm comfortable waiting until January for council to touch this again. Okay. Thank you for that, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Um, I actually like the idea that it's coming back because um, it means that we still have a chance to discuss, debate it, and the public has more opportunity to come on in. So um, I think that's what we're doing because we're talking about it here. Um, so I'm all in support of it. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Oh, go ahead. Uh, CAO Galante. Your, your Worship. OK. One moment, Councillor O'Connor. CAO Galante. Thank you. Um, just. Just to clarify the intent, so um, today we got very clear uh, feed feedback, and thank you for that, and direction from Council in, in a series of amendments. Um, typically, under uh, my purview here tomorrow, I will sign this policy. And it's in, it's in effect, the, I think the intent is to be communicated on Friday, I believe, on the 15th or Monday, and we will proceed as per your direction. If if the, there is a motion to bring back the main motion, the amended motion to commit to council, I just need clarification about what's going to happen then. There will be a subsequent discussion, potential more amendments, because that will delay the timelines for implementation. Remember the graph with the November 15th, December uh, 15th, December 30th, and January 17th. So um, on my end, I am very clear what we need to do in terms of implementation. Um, as, as presented today. So I'm not sure if that is so, the intent. Councillor Blackmore, just turn on your mic, please. So I would reword the motion so that it said uh, we direct uh, administration to move forward with this policy as amended. Yes. Because we don't actually need to see it again. Uh, we're going to see it again multiple times over the course of the next four years. So. Or hopefully less. <laughs> hopefully way less. The whole time we're here. <laughs> All right, Councillor O'Connor. Mike to work. Um, I agree with that last point. I was a little confused as to what was the intent. And I think uh, CAO Galanti, based on the timeline that was laid out by uh, Mr. Sheldon, that we need to get this on the go. And I think I'm in support that we let administration do their job and you're gonna bring it back anyways, thank you. And I regrettably, I have another meeting to go to, so I have to go to a library board meeting right now, thank you. You're more than welcome to excuse yourself at any point, Councillor O'Connor, but the meeting is not complete. Thank you. All right, further discussion or debate on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Sorry, Councillor O'Toole. Councillor O'Toole votes in favor. Uh, I shut my machine off too, so I'll Mr. vote. Season, yeah, vote? adamantly opposed. And that motion is carried eight to one. Thank you for your time. I'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. Okay. I can only close this in four minutes. <laughs>